Okay, we are live here in the Senate Finance Committee on February 10th, 2022. We've got a busy schedule ahead of us. We've got seven bills, um, and we are going to start uh, with Senator Hayes, Senate Bill 275. And so just a little heads up because we have a a lot of witnesses uh, live here on this bill. There, Hayes, I, I think we're getting some backdrop. I don't know if it's from you. Okay. Um, it's all the different. Yeah, so everybody try to mute yourself because there's a little back um, backlash here. Okay, so we've got a sponsor panel with Senator Hayes and three witnesses on his panel. So we'll go through the full panel of, of Senator Hayes and the three witnesses. We'll take questions. And then we're going to hold off questions for the proponents um, witnesses. Let's go through all the favorable witnesses um, and the fit one favorable with amendment. And then we'll take questions for all those folks. And then we'll go to the unfavorables and hold off questions until all the unfavorables are, are done. I think that's the simplest way to handle that today. Um, and so, Senator Hayes, with all that said, on Senate Bill 275, we're gonna start with you and you have unlimited time, but then your panel's gonna be, as you well know, uh, you know, uh, relegated to that two minute time clock, but you have as much time as you need to present the bills. So Senator Hayes, uh, you've got the floor. Absolutely. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair and colleagues uh, for this opportunity. Before I get into my testimony, we've heard this bill before um, in previous years. This wouldn't be the first time we bought this bill to the Senate Finance Committee. I, I will tell you this year is much different. Um, and it's different because we have a collection of individuals, most of which have volunteered uh, to, to really, really um, help educate the community and Marylanders about the need for paid family and medical leave insurance. And so uh, before I begin, I just want to thank all of the heroic and dedicated efforts of those volunteers and others that have really raised this issue um, among Marylanders. Um, as, as you've alluded to on my uh, panel today, and you'll hear from shortly, who's joined me as Reagan Vaughn, Ma Molly Williamson, as well as um, Kelly Schultzman. Sorry if I pronounced Kelly your name wrong. Uh, but here's the thing, uh, colleagues, Mr. Chair, most Marylanders, whatever their circumstances, will at some point in their lives need extended time away from work to provide necessary care for a family member or for themselves. A number of situations requiring leave may arise, such as welcoming a new baby or newly adopted child. Having to care for an aging parent or loved one with serious health needs. As I shared in my testimony last year, I've had the opportunity to care for my grandmother who raised me when I was younger during a critical time in my life, I had the privilege of returning the favor by taking care of Nanny during her struggle with Alzheimer's disease. This is a really important piece of legislation for many families throughout Maryland who have the awesome responsibility of being caregivers for loved ones who helped them along the way. Like my experience with my grandma, the Time, the time to Care Act by establishing a family and medical leave insurance program would make paid leave available to Marylanders, Maryland workers for up to 12 weeks following the birth or adoption of a child and when needed to provide care for a family member or for oneself. A family member in this piece of legislation is defined as a child, a parent, spouse, grandparent, grandchild, sibling, adoptive, foster, uh, guardianship, um, and, and step relationships are well are included in these categories. Support for this legislation crosses party lines. Uh, there was a poll conducted of 1,077 Marylanders done um, just recently in December 2021 and January 22, yielded strong support with 88% favoring the proposal. This support has crossed lines cross party lines of the 88% in favor of paid family leave. 94% are Democrats, 77% Republicans, and 85% independents support this legislation. Having to take unpaid leave forces families to endure 
financial hardships, mental and physical stress, which is a determinant not only to employees, but employers expecting quality output as well. The United States is the only industrialized country to not guarantee some of their paid family leave for workers. Only 23% of US workers have access to paid family leave and fewer than 40% have their personal leave for short-term disabilities. Nearly 25% of women, for example, take 10 or fewer days of parental leave, potentially putting themselves and their children at risk physically and emotionally. This pandemic has only heightened the need for a family leave program, and that is what the Time to Care Act provides. COVID-19 has emphasized the importance of paid leave. Since the start of the pandemic, over 966,000 Marylanders have contracted COVID-19, and many have had to make impossible choices between personal family health and economic security. This legislation will provide replacement during the leave period ranging from $50 to $1,000. The benefit level is calculated based on Maryland workers' average weekly wage, which is approximately $1,080, $1,080. Based on the economic analysis and experience from other states, the shared contribution total, 0.67% of wages, the bill mandates that the shared contribution may not exceed 0.75% of the employee's wages. A Maryland worker earning the average weekly wage, approximately $1,080, would contribute a total of $6, I'm sorry, $3.62 per week. Again, approximately a Maryland worker and an earning an average weekly wage of approximately $1,000. And eighty dollars will contribute a total of three dollars and sixty-two sixty-two cents per week. Low-income workers and their employers will contribute significantly less. A total of nine states and Washington D.C. have already moved to this direction. Many Maryland is overdue for a change. California, New Jersey, Rhode Island have had long-standing programs. Paid family and medical leave means a stronger economy, healthier families and businesses, greater equity, regardless of a person's job, and more workplace equity for women. My colleagues on the Senate Finance Committee, I strongly urge a favorable report for Senate Bill 275. Okay, thank you, Senator Hayes, for your testimony. As I said at the outset, we're going to go to your panel and then we'll come back and any questions will be either for Senator Hayes or the three uh, sponsor panelists. So next will be a Reagan Vaughn. Um, I'm looking for. I'm here. OK, there you are, Reagan. Um, OK, so Reagan, you've got uh, this fine. You've got uh, two minutes. Thank you. Good afternoon, Mr. Vice Chair and members of the committee. My name is Regan Vaughn. I'm the Director of Advocacy for Catholic Charities and a member of the Time to Care Coalition. I'm here in strong support of SB 275. Senator Hayes did an excellent job outlining the program and I'm happy to take any questions on the specifics of the bill, but I wanted to focus my two minutes on why this bill is important, on who it's going to help. At Catholic Charities of Baltimore, we serve Marylanders across Central and Western Maryland in a variety of program types. Enactment of this bill would be a game changer for our clients across the board. This bill could help the senior who's residing in one of our senior apartment communities, whose children are pressuring her to move into an assisted living facility because they just don't have the ability to care for her if she falls again. This bill could help the mom who recently had to hide in a storage closet at her place of employment to participate in family therapy for her child who was hospitalized for psychiatric reasons because she didn't have access to paid leave. This bill could help the new dad who had to report to work while his premature baby was in the NICU and his wife was home recovering while dealing with a two-year-old. This bill could help the small business owner who feels helpless to financially support an employee who has had to take time to battle, I'm sorry, had to take time during her battle with cancer. This bill could help an employee who's just having an awful year 
She's recovering from her own health emergency while assuming caregiving responsibilities for a parent with a terminal illness. This bill is designed to help all of us. Now you're gonna hear from the opponents a lot about the administrative burden, the excess costs, and those are legitimate concerns and they're things we can discuss and we can work through. But it's this committee's role to weigh those concerns against the vast amount of testimony you're gonna hear behind me and in the written testimony you have outlining the benefits for children, for families, for employees, for employers, for public health, and for our state's economy. I would urge a favorable report on SB 275. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Ms. Swan, for your te testimony. We're gonna next turn to uh, Molly Williamson. Ms. Williamson, uh, you've got two minutes. Thank you, good afternoon. And um, thank you again to the vice chair, the sponsor, and the committee for the opportunity to testify today. My name is Molly Weston Williamson, and I'm director of paid leave and future of work at A Better Balance, a legal advocacy organization whose mission is to fight for policies that will protect the ability of American workers to avoid having to choose between caring for themselves and their families and maintaining their economic security. To that end, we've been working on paid family and medical leave in states across the country, including Maryland, for over a decade. We're delighted that Maryland is considering this important issue and proud to support this critical legislation. The need for paid leave has never been more urgent. Nationwide, the lack of paid leave costs American workers and their families $22.5 billion each year in lost wages alone. When the COVID-19 pandemic hit, states that already had paid leave programs in place did better, while workers in states without these protections, even with some emergency interventions, struggled because of their absence, compromising the effectiveness of our pandemic response. As we move forward, paid family and medical leave will ensure workers can take the time they need to address their own or a loved one's COVID-related needs in years to come. At the same time, paid leave, like what this bill would provide, responds to longstanding needs with profound and demonstrated health and economic benefits. To date, Nine states and the District of Columbia have passed paid family and medical leave laws. Programs are already in place under eight of these laws, providing benefits to workers across the country each day, and are currently being implemented in the remaining two. The bill before you today built on the successful time-tested model from these states, which have amply demonstrated how paid leave programs can benefit workers, businesses, the economy, and our communities. The evidence shows that a paid leave program like this one under consideration today can do the same for Maryland. You can find additional information about existing state programs in our written testimony, including a comparative chart of existing state programs, or I'd be happy to answer any questions you have. Thank you, and we look forward to continuing to work with you to make paid leave a reality for Maryland and to move forward this important legislation. Okay, thank you, Ms. Williamson, for your testimony. The final uh, member of the sponsor panel is Kaylee uh, um, Ms. Schumitz, you've got two minutes. Uh, thank you, Vice Chair, and thanks to Senator Hayes for uh, introducing this legislation. My name is Callie Schumitz. I'm with the Maryland Center on Economic Policy. We're a nonprofit, nonpartisan research organization focused on state fiscal and economic policy. We're here in strong support of uh, SB 275. Um, for the reason, basically, to put it very simply, it's good for people, it's good for businesses, and that will translate to broader economic benefits. Uh, the majority of working people in the U.S., including Maryland, do not have paid leave that they can use to take care of the kinds of family needs we will all experience at some point in our lives. Research shows that the two main reasons people don't take unpaid leave are not being able to afford it and concerns about job security, both of which this bill addresses. Uh, this creates great hardship for families and has significant societal costs. Um, that SB 275 could help re reverse, and that I think many other speakers will address this today. I'm going to focus most of my time on the fact um, on the effect on businesses. Right now, the responsibility for providing paid family and medical leave provide falls solely on businesses, and especially for small businesses, it is often not affordable for them, even if the business owner wants to provide leave for their employees. By creating the shared public insurance pool as outlined in SB 275, the cost for any one person or business is very modest because it's spread across the whole state. Um, and also workers' ability to take a meaningful amount of paid leave is no longer dependent on their employer's ability or willingness to provide it. The surveys conducted in states that already have family and medical leave programs show that the programs 
either don't affect businesses' bottom line or they have a positive impact. Um, and this is uh, just as true as uh, small businesses are equally or more likely to report a positive impact than larger businesses. The, business, the biggest cost savings for businesses is reduced turnover. As uh, peer reviewed studies show that having paid leave makes people more likely to return to the job after they've taken care of their family health or medical issue. Um, and as we see with our safety net programs, it is also generally better for businesses when families are more financially stable because they have more money to spend at businesses in their community and because reducing poverty has a wide range of positive impacts. Um, I think I'm about at the end of my time, but I will also note that Maryland Center Economic Policy has done significant analysis on the impacts of the bills in different ways. So I'm happy to help answer questions about that. And I just wanna note our research analyst, Christopher Meyer, who has done a lot of that analysis, has also signed up to testify mostly so that he could help respond to those questions as well. Thank you uh, for your time. And we would ask for a favorable report. Okay, thank you, Ms. Schumitz. Okay, we're gonna open up uh, questions for the panel, including um, sponsor, Senator Hayes. Let me lead off I, I, uh, just with one question. I'm gonna direct it to Ms. Williamson because you talked about other states. And so a couple of years ago, I actually chaired a task force on this very subject along with Delegate Kelly. So I am familiar with it, uh, you know, kind of what's evolved over the last many years. So just specifically on the state of Washington, I do always point to that a little bit because that was an early adopter and that was one where the Chamber of Commerce in that state, as I remember, actually um, supported the proposal out there. So, uh, but I think the state of Washington's been in the news recently. So, Ms. Williamson, maybe you could just um, get me and the committee up to speed. What's happening currently and what has happened just recently in the state of Washington on this very uh, topic on and the program that was enacted out there? Sure, I'd be happy to. And I'll say I was... Um... My first time visiting Annapolis was to testify before that exact task force. So I'm excited to be back um, with this group. So what folks may have heard is that in the last couple of weeks, the news broke that Washington State's paid family and medical leave program is experiencing some solvency challenges. Um, and I think those are being dealt with in Washington. Policymakers there are working hard on solutions to make sure that program will continue, but it is concerning. And it is something that policymakers um, in other states, I think would be remiss to not think about and not address. Um, so I think in terms of what Washington means for Maryland, um, I think there's sort of three main points we're thinking about. Um, the first is that Washington is one state among many and the other states that have paid leave programs are not experiencing the same kind of challenges. Um, those programs have by and large been able to address and respond in the way their programs were designed to do um, to ensure that they remain stable and solvent. Um, so one example is um, Maryland's neighbor DC started their program just six months after Washington State um, in mid 2020. Um, and they actually were able recently to significantly expand their medical leave benefits without raising premiums. Um, so I think the thing to think about here is that Washington is an important data point, but we're seeing several other states that are not experiencing the same challenges. And I think those give us some lessons on how to ensure stability. Um, the second thing I'll say, and I'm happy to talk in more detail if folks are interested, but um, Maryland has the opportunity to make a couple of key policy choices in a way that would go in a different direction from what Washington state has done and learn from the states that are not um, having these same problems in a way that I think gives Maryland a lot of tools um, to avoid that. I think this bill already makes a lot of those key policy choices. Um, and finally, the thing I would say, and I think this goes exactly um, to your point, Mr. Vice Chair, is... Um, Sitting here in February 2022, we have a lot of information that the creators of Washington State didn't have um, when they were putting together their program in 2017, including the data out of Washington State, the data out of DC, the data out of Massachusetts um, of their real world experience, along with the data out of longer standing state programs in response to COVID. And so what Maryland policymakers had the opportunity to do that Washington State policymakers couldn't have done is use all of that information in things like the modeling that some of my colleagues have already mentioned um, so that Maryland is operating from a place of a lot more information than Washington State was able to do. And I think Canon is using that information um, to shore up the fund. But again, happy to talk in more detail if that's helpful. Okay, thank you. That was a, a very, very helpful. Um, I'm gonna turn it to the committee now. We're gonna start with Senator Hershey. 
Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And if I could um, continue with uh, Ms. Williamson for a moment. Um, again, I, I did think the panel did a very nice job of, of splitting up some of the issues with this. So I'll stick with what we were just talking about first. But Mr. Chairman, you had mentioned before that we've seen this before, but for people that may not have been with us and remember some of this, Molly, could you explain the difference between paid safe and sick leave federal FMLA and what this bill does. Absolutely, thank you. Um, so um, paid sick and safe leave, which Maryland already has, tends to be uh, accrued benefits that are provided directly by employers um, that we tend to talk about in terms of hours or days um, that address a whole range of health needs, um, those that are serious and those that are not. So we think about paid sick days as time you can use when you or your family are sick or hurt or need some kind of medical care or are responding to needs around domestic violence. Whereas paid family and medical leave, what we're talking about today, um, when we talk about that in health context, we're talking about serious health needs. Um, a, a colleague once summarized it as um, paid sick days are cold, paid family medical leave is cancer. Uh, and it's not exactly right, but I think it's a helpful shorthand. Paid family and medical leave also addresses bonding with a new child, caring for, again, a seriously ill loved one and some military family needs. Um, paid family and medical leave, like what's being discussed here today, tends to be structured exactly as Maryland's program would be through a social insurance system, where employers, employees, or a combination of both pay into an insurance fund that pays out your benefits, um, which is quite different than paid sick and safe leave. And it's different on purpose, because I think everyone recognizes that um, asking employers to pay out of pocket for, as this bill would do, 12 weeks of paid leave is not realistic or fair, which is why the state and policymakers are showing up to have employers' backs um, and do this here. Federal FMLA, um, the Federal Family and Medical Leave Act, um, is a federal law that provides to covered workers the right to unpaid um, but job protected time for basically the same needs covered by this bill. So, to bond with a new child, address your own serious health needs, care for a seriously ill loved one, or address the impact of military deployment. Um, so, FMLA. For folks who are covered, which unfortunately close to half of the workforce is not, um, based on the FMLA's coverage requirements, um, gives you the right to the time off from your job and to keep your health insurance, but it doesn't give you the right to get paid for that time. And so we know for many, many workers, even if on paper, um, they are eligible for FMLA leave, which again, nearly half the workforce isn't, um, it's not accessible in practice because they can't afford to take the leave unpaid, particularly for folks who are living paycheck to paycheck. So I think we tend to think about these three things as fitting together um, in a, a, an ecosystem and a, a carefully constructed structure um, to ensure that everyone ends up with what they need in a way that meets the needs of both workers and employers. Thank you very much. Um, follow up on another point you brought up. You said Maryland has the opportunity to make policy decisions based on what we are able to learn from other states. Does this bill specifically address the issues that the state of Washington is experiencing? Uh, I think that it does. Um, so I think um, a couple of ways in which um, what Maryland is looking at doing and what's already in this bill here and what I think could be built out in regulations or implementation um, from this bill that are different from Washington state. Um, one is that um, Washington state's initial premium for the first three years of their program was only 0.4%. Um, this bill would allow um, the Secretary of Labor to set the rate as high as 0.7%. Um, so that gives the Secretary of Labor some additional tools to figure out, again, using this new data, um, what's the rate that Maryland needs to be safe. The second thing is um, Washington State's program, while it's generally a shared employer-employee cost, um, exempts from paying in, though they're still covered, um, employers who have fewer than 50 employees. Um, and what that shakes out to is everyone who was not paying in, that affects the total amount coming into the fund. Um, so the bill before you today does not have any employer size exemption. I know legislation being considered in the other chamber um, has a 15 employee exemption, but 15 is very different than 50 um, mm -hmm. in terms of the impact. So that's another difference. Um, a third option is I think, um, and this is a place that I think um, the bill could probably be um, flushed out a little or clarified a little in regulations. Um, is uh, Washington State, in the way that they set their premiums once their program started, once they had real world data, 
um, is unique from other states. Um, and I think Maryland has the opportunity to look at what a number of other states like California, New Jersey, Massachusetts do in terms of, I think, being just a little more responsive um, to the real world data out of Maryland. So once you've had this program, say, for a year, um, Maryland will have the opportunity to say, OK, we know how much money we spent last year. We know here's how much buffer we want to have. We can use all of that information to figure out how much we need to raise um, going forward in a way that I think um, Washington state was sort of um, uniquely boxed in by their statute um, in terms of use of that information. And I think Maryland has an opportunity to do better. Um, <clears throat> I think those are some of the key pieces. And I think more broadly, um, when the secretary of labor is setting this rate, I assume there will be you know, robust cost modeling, including some building on the work of my colleagues on this panel. And I think um, in doing that modeling, they'll be able to take into account all of this data that just was not available three, four years ago because it hadn't happened yet. Thank, thank you very much. I appreciate that uh, very detailed response. Mr. Chairman, if I could ask one more question. Sure, to, and, then, uh, and then we'll go to Senator Reedy. I just would remind the, the committee, we do have 30 witnesses behind, uh, behind the panel here. But with that said, uh, yep. one question just, for Senator Hershey, and then we'll go to uh, Senator Reedy. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, I think it was uh, Ms. Schumitz is the one that talked about the businesses um, and, and some of the effects on the businesses. Um, I wondered if, if in your, I guess, analysis or study of, of, of how um, policy like this would affect businesses, if you heard from them, you addressed cost a little bit, but if you heard from them about the backfilling of the job responsibilities when um, an employee is away from the workplace for an extended period of time, how businesses were able to handle that absence of the employee. Great. Uh, yeah, thank you for that question, Senator. Um, and I think there also will be some uh, business owners speaking today who could also share their own personal experience. But I think um, this bill creates a um, much greater ability for businesses to do that um, than they would under the current system um, because the um, the businesses themselves are not going to be paying, not necessarily going to be paying the cost of the employee's leave. They could opt to top off um, their pay beyond what um, the uh, public benefits provide. Um, but that means that there, that gives them funding that they could use to uh, temporarily fill that position, get some uh, some temp help to help meet those needs. So, you know, I am part of the, the management team for a small business. We are a nonprofit, but nonprofits are businesses too. And, you know, I definitely uh, personally understand the challenges that come up when you uh, have someone who's out on parental leave. Um, we are able to thankfully provide some paid parental leave uh, in our organization, but um, you know, this would make it much easier because um, uh, the employee would be getting compensated through the fund and then that would free up money in our budget to potentially bring in part-time help to help fill backfill that workload. So, um, and yeah, uh, I think as I, I did state in my testimony, the businesses and states that have this now generally like the program they're comfortable with with where things are now that it's in place yeah i i appreciate that i think when when we hear about the 18 percent of the country that is doing this um it's more about how it's being paid for and how the 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 you know shared insurance goes um but mr chairman i i would like if, if at some point in time i just you know reserve the right to talk to hear from some of the business on how they're treating that vacancy of the employees and maybe they'll be able to bring that up in their testimony. I think you're gonna have ample opportunity because we have, there are many witnesses that probably fit that category. So Senator Reed, thank I, you. we're gonna to go to you next and then uh, absent thank you, burning thank questions, you, we can go on to the rest of the witness. Senator Reedy. Your thank name. you, Mr. Vice Chair. And it is important to set some things out here on the early part. We obviously wanna hear from everybody that has experience sure. new points. I so I, I agree. Um, so I, just following up on Senator Hershey's questioning, I think, um, and I'll ask anybody on the panel this, this question, 
One, one concern I have is I actually appreciate the aims of it. I really do. And I know we want to try to strengthen and help families as much as we can, but we have to figure out, you know, businesses have really taken it on the chin, small businesses, particularly during the pandemic from an economic perspective, as we've all dealt with the health uh, issues. How do we know if we're going to implement a, a plan like this, you, you're going to be telling a lot, a lot of people are going to find out by surprise that they have a draw on their paycheck. And it, even if, it's only $3 a paycheck on average. For some people, it'll be more. Some might be a little less. For businesses, they're going to they're gonna find out, hey, we've got to start doing this. How do we know that workers will all be on board? To me, this is something that we had the discussion on a, previous, on a different bill about adding a charge onto people's insurance, basically, and letting them know they can opt out. This way, they wouldn't even be able to opt out. Can anybody speak to that and how that is from a, an equity standpoint or sort of a a fairness standpoint that we're going to implement this, whether somebody wants it or not. Uh, Senator Reedy, is that directed at anybody specifically, the sponsor, the three panelists? Maybe the sponsor, any- Senator. I mean, I actually really, you know, Senator Hayes, I mean, just really respect, I know the perspective yeah. you're coming on it. I, I just, that that is a, something I, I always have trouble when we talk about these issues about putting something in place that people don't really have an option. They just have to do it. Right. <laughs> One, um, earlier in my testimony, I talked about the response um, of Marylanders who, who responded to questions about paid sick leave and overwhelmingly um, Marylanders supported across party lines. And so um, there is already an awareness out there that this is something that um, employers, employees as well as employers um, want to see. Most times in any employment that one would have um, they want to know what what the benefits that are available to them, and I would imagine, you know, just like anything else, there would be, you know, they they would inquire about what be- benefits they're entitled to. Also, you know, our very own State Department of Labor and License and Regulation, oftentimes as new regulations or new, um, you know, laws are passed that affect employees, make that information available to those um, employees and employers that this is an available benefit. And so I don't think people have to look very far to know um, that this is coming about. Um, A lot of the public awareness around the issue is already there. So I I appreciate the answers, but you 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 talked about the benefits available to somebody when they take a job and they learn about it, but this will impact people who are- Oh, Senator Reedy, you're muted. This would be people who are on the same job for 18 years on a job. I mean, it's- um, I guess I, I guess a question that I I'll, I'll summarize with this and Mr. Chairman. And then after that, I'll we'll let it go because I know we have a lot of testimony. It, what I feel like there should be a way that we can we can come up with a plan, and maybe somebody on the panel has some experience here. There's got to be a way that this could be something that people could choose to enter into. That there'd be an insurance package out there. There'd be a a sick bank type. Mm-hmm. And I know we can't get into recreating things here on a hearing, but to me, the idea of coercing this. From every small business and and workers, you can say it's for their own good, but you know a lot of businesses would be smart to probably come up with a, some programs like this to retain employees. Right now, the fight is finding enough quality employees to fill roles. Uh, so I, I don't know if, if anybody on the panel could comment on that, but why can't there be a a quasi governmental or private sector solution that doesn't involve everybody has to be opted into something that is going to be a fee on their paycheck and every business will pay into by mandate. I, I don't know if anybody can answer that question, and then I'll be happy to listen to the to the rest of the testimony. Or anybody on the uh, sponsor panel want to take a crack at it, either Senator Hayes or any of the three uh, folks behind them? Sure, I'd be happy to, to start. I think, um, first, you, you mentioned the impact that uh, particularly small businesses have faced right now, and I think that's absolutely right. And I think that's um, honestly, one of the best reasons to pass this legislation is I think there's an opportunity to level the playing field for small businesses. I think lots and lots of small businesses would love to be able to offer the same kind of benefit that a larger employer can afford to pay for out of pocket and it's just not realistic. So what's uh, stopping them? I'm sorry, I don't want to interrupt you. I don't want to be rude. I, I actually am curious, what's stopping a business, businesses from aligning? What's stopping NFIB from having their collection of businesses or or the, the Montgomery County Chamber of Commerce, or I'm just picking things out of the air, but I mean, what's stopping a consortium from developing like this now? I mean, I, I think um, the, I, I don't know what is stopping them. I know we haven't seen it yet. I think we, we've you know been having this conversation for some time and we haven't seen it. I think at the individual small business level, um, it's just not, I think that, that's not a, a realistic or fair thing 
um, to ask a small business. Job. I think lots of small businesses do and, and do so at great cost and small nonprofits do as well. Um, I say as someone who has just taken in the last three years, two leaves from my small nonprofit uh, and was very fortunate to benefit from a state program in doing that. Um, but I think this is a tool we can give to small businesses to compete in a, a tight labor market. Um, and I think another thing to think about here is that um, we often think about paid leave in terms of the really happy moments that it comes with, like welcoming a new child, but it's also often for the most stressful and difficult moments. So when a serious illness strikes, when a loved one is sick, the, the times you hope never come. And I think don't expect to come. And that's a place where I think in the same way that, you know, we all need car insurance, um, but you hope you never get in Iraq. I think one of the benefits of having a system that everybody is part of and that everyone's costs are lower because everybody is part of um, is that even if you hope never to need it, um, it's there when you need it, even if you didn't expect it. Okay, Mr. Chairman, I'm, I, my concern is we're saying we're doing this for your own good now pay up, but I, that, you know, that'll be the debate I know we have as we- I, I think you framed some of the issues there, uh, Senator Reedy. Okay, any other questions for the sponsor or the sponsor panel before we move to the favorable list? Okay, seeing none, as I said earlier, we're gonna go through all the favorable testimony and then we'll open it up for questions, okay? So we're gonna start with uh, uh, Tammy Bresnahan. Ms. Bresnahan? There you are. Yes. Hi, good afternoon, yes. Mr. Chair and members of the Senate Finance Committee. My name is Tammy Bresnahan. I'm the Director of Advocacy for AARP Maryland. We're one of those people that served on the task force almost six years ago with you. And so we're proud of the work that we did there. I'm just gonna tip on one. Um, we do support uh, Senate Bill 275 and we thank Senator Hayes for bringing this bill forward and being a champion on this issue. Um, we're mainly concerned about the caregivers and the, con the economic consequences, um, reducing work hours, quitting a job to provide care or taking unplanned early retirement can have a significant effect on caregivers and especially older caregivers. Um, the substantial economic risk and short term have financial um, setbacks in social security and other retirement plans. Given the aging population of the workforce, caregiver-friendly policies like fa paid family leave is important, and we hope that you think it is too. We support and ask the committee for a favorable report. You have my um, written testimony, including footnotes, and um, I appreciate any feedback. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Ms. Bresnahan. Next witness is Michelle Siri. Ms. Siri. Yes, hi, good afternoon, Mr. Vice Chair. I see Madam Chair is here, members of the committee. My name is Michelle Siri. I'm the Executive Director of the Women's Law Center of Maryland. I'm also here on behalf of the Maryland Legislative Agenda for Women. I too would like to first thank Senator Hayes for continuing to champion this issue. I'm also here to tell you all that the working women of the state are at a breaking point. We have been sounding the alarm for years with two thirds of women in Maryland being the sole primary or co-breadwinners of our families while simultaneously bearing the brunt of the caregiving. But now the pandemic has hit critical mass for working women and the she session is still wreaking havoc on our families. Women are overrepresented in many of the sectors that have been hardest hit, hospitality, leisure, restaurants, education, counting for as much as 83% of the jobs lost in those sectors. Back in December, 2020, we saw an unprecedented number of women leave the workforce with women accounting for all the net jobs lost in this country. The most recent jobs report for January, 2022 was optimistic though, showing promising signs of recovery, but again, not for women. That growth was driven by men who have now recouped all of their job losses since the pandemic began, while women are still struggling to catch up. In fact, there are nearly 1.1 million fewer women in the workforce now compared to February of 2020. But this isn't that surprising given everything that we know about women in the workforce. Everyone's heard about the need to shatter glass ceilings, but there's so many other barriers that exist, particularly for women in low wage positions. Take the sticky floor where women get stuck being unable to progress in their position or salary because every time a life event happens, such as an ill partner or parent passing, or in my case, after the birth of my first son, women continually put their careers on hold and get pushed back down the ladder of success. I experienced the sticky floor firsthand when I was taken off partnership track and denied bonuses for trying to juggle motherhood in my career. Then there's the leaky pipeline where women enter the workforce at the same rate as men, but as they progress through their career, the number of women dwindle, being forced out of the workplace altogether due to competing work and caregiving demands. So this is what we are seeing being played out in real time as schools and daycare closures are preventing women from returning to the workforce as we have a, a shortage of in-home caregivers. 
All of these scenarios could be addressed by implementing paid family leave. For all of these reasons and more, we strongly urge a favorable report on Senate Bill 275. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Ms. Siri, for your testimony. Our next witness is um, Mara, Mara Greengrass, Ms. Greengrass. So, Ms. Greengrass, you've got two minutes. Good afternoon, members of the Finance Committee. My name is Mara Greengrass, and I am not here representing anyone other than myself. Uh, I am a lifelong Marylander, a resident of Rockville for the past 22 years, and I've been self-employed since 2006. Uh, when I was pregnant with my son in 2008, uh, I was so ill that I literally was working from my bed, flat on my back, with my head tilted just to the side so that I could see my laptop. Uh, I worked up until about 12 hours before he was born uh, and went back to work as soon as I could afterward. Uh, then in 2018, my mother was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer, and I had to, in a very short period of time, move my parents out of their house in Columbia and into two separate care facilities down here in Rockville. I got very good at taking meetings and writing reports from hospital rooms, doctor's waiting rooms, places like that. Uh, not the best place to work. Uh, my bosses and coworkers have been nothing but supportive over the years, but the fact remains, if I don't work, I don't get paid. Uh, paid family and medical leave will enable Marylanders like me, uh, freelancers, contractors, consultants, other people who don't get uh, employer benefits to take care of their own health and to help the health, the health of their loved ones. Uh, this plan closes a loophole that has left people like me out in the cold. And I respectfully urge this committee to report favorably on SB 275. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Ms. Greengrass, for your testimony. We're gonna now uh, move to uh, Paula Molina Acosta is our next witness. Uh, Ms. Acosta, thank you. Uh, good afternoon. I am speaking in favor of SB 275, the Time to Care Act of 2022. Um, I'm Paula, I have lived in Maryland for most of my life and I'm representing the National Partnership for Women and Families. We are a national advocacy organization working to achieve equity for all women. So at the very center of our mission is addressing the crisis that leaves just 23% of workers with access to paid family leave. And as a society, we have chosen to let the rest of us, the vast majority of us, face a terrible choice between economic stability and the needs of our families or even our own health. So over the last two decades, the National Partnership has helped states develop paid leave programs that have strengthened families, businesses, the economy, and, pay and public health. So in short, these programs have, these state programs have proven that paid leave works. It is affordable for workers and employers and it is fiscally sound. Research highlights substantial benefits for families' well-beings and economic stability, including a reduced need for public safety net aid. Unlike private plans, a public program covers the most vulnerable workers and those in most in need of support. All of the state paid leave programs have been proven to be, have proven to be financially stable. Despite their fears, once paid leave programs are implemented, businesses have faced minimal burdens while citing benefits to employee morale, productivity, and turnover rates. It's particularly helped small businesses to be able to offer benefits that allow them to compete with larger corporations. In these states, paid leave is immensely popular among voters of all stripes. And this is why states who have implemented paid leave have been doubling down by expanding access, increasing benefits, and extending the duration of leave. So we thank the committee for considering a paid leave program, and we look forward to helping in any way we can. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Costa, for your testimony. Our next witness is Monica Roberts. Ms. Roberts? Is Ms. Roberts here in the house? Okay. Uh, Hi. Okay. Okay, there we got there you. you. There you Can are. You okay. You're, you're up for two minutes, Ms. Roberts. Okay. My name is Monica Roberts, and I am testifying on behalf of myself and my fellow members in SEIU Local 500. SEIU Local 500 represents over 20,000 working people in the region, including support staff at Montgomery County Public Schools, family child care providers, faculty and staff at institutions of higher education, staff at nonprofits, and many other working people across the region. As a school administrative secretary at MCI, MCPS, I'm here today to share with you my support and SEIU's support of SB 275, the Time to Care Act, from my perspective as a mother, a union member, and a senior citizen. SEIU Local 500 thanks Senators Hayes and Benson for their leadership on this important issue. 
Seven years ago, I became ill and required life-saving surgery along with the difficult recovery period. I can testify to how important it is to be able to have your child or loved one be able to take the time from work to take care of you. My daughter, Patty, was with me every step of the way. She was able to stay at home and take care of me as well as sit at the hospital and take me back and forth to many doctor appointments. She did this regardless of the financial burden and the strain it put on her family. She did this because I am her mother and that was the end of that. In 2018, complications from the surgery three years before became another life-saving event. By this time, I had retired and was living on a very tight budget. I was concerned about co-pays, hospital stays, my daily cost of living. My daughter, Patty, was with me again. I was again, as before, concerned over the time I was taking her away from work, the threat to her family and her family's financial state. She spent so much time driving me back and forth to doctors, sitting at hospitals, and just the extreme weight of the situation we were in opened the door for worry. The freedom or ability to put the financial expense to the side and be able to be there for a family member in need is sometimes all a person can handle. To be honest, I was concerned about sharing my story with you. I was concerned if you would really listen and understand what I was telling you about my story. Thinking about my future health and the possibility of another health crisis, I find myself extremely scared. Assessing the specifics, a child who wants to take time for her mother, but the financial burden to do so is not only frightening, but lends itself to a feeling of helplessness. What if I became so ill where I needed help around the clock? How can I ask my daughter to take time from her work and put her financial burden on to take care of me when, I was, when she was already had a family? No Marylander should ever have to choose between a paycheck and caring for a family member. The issue is that when a family goes through a health crisis, it is not just only a crisis for the ill person. It is also a crisis for the family who wants to provide the much needed support and resources. It is a family crisis. Passing the Time to Care Act will provide the support and resources at the time when the family needs it the most. SEIU Local 500 respectfully requests that you support SB 275 and strongly urge a favorable committee report. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Ms. Roberts. Sounds like you have some backup there in the room, but um, <laughs> thank you for your testimony. We're going to now move to our next witness, Margo uh, Quinlan. Oh, and I'm sorry, I apologize. Ruth Martin is our next witness. Ms. Martin. Uh, Senator Benson, we're going to wait until all the favorable witnesses are done, and then we're going to come back to questions, okay? Okay, so Ruth Martin, uh, you've got two minutes, Ms. Martin. Helps if I unmute. Um, thank you, you very much, uh, Chair Kelly and Vice Chair Feldman, and members of the Finance Committee for holding this incredibly important hearing about the need for paid family and medical leave in Maryland. On behalf of Moms Rising's 30,000 plus Maryland members from across the state, we urge a favorable report on SB 275. My name is Ruth Martin. I'm the Senior Vice President of Workplace Justice Programs at Moms Rising, which is a national organization fighting for women and families and their economic security. We're also fighting for a national paid family and medical leave program that would set a minimum floor across the country. But I'm also a Marylander. I live and work and raise my family here in Silver Spring. Additionally, I also served on that paid leave task force with you, Senator Feldman, a few years ago, and also serve on the board of the directors of the Maryland Legislative Agenda for Women. So my interest and support of the Time to Care Act is both personal and professional. And while it is clear that we need a national paid leave program in this country, it is also imperative that Maryland pass paid leave and do it as soon as possible. As you've already heard today, but it bears repeating, the need for paid leave is urgent and it is clear. Paid leave is good for our economy. It keeps people attached to the workforce, which is incredibly important. Um, it, uh, it is good for our families and it's good for our economic security. It is also clear that at the moment, um, paid leave has become a bit of a political issue on the Hill and has stalled out as part of the Build Back Better program. And while Congress continues to figure out how to move forward on these critical issues, and I am sure that they will, Maryland can and should act now. 
As you've also heard, nine other states have already passed state paid leave laws with bipartisan support, which is not surprising. Paid leave is a nonpartisan issue and enjoys enormous support from voters, regardless of party affiliation. So while it is important that we win a national minimum standard on leave, the truth is that it may be a ways off. And in the meantime, states like Maryland, where the real innovators of policy do their work, they need to act now. You can and should pass paid leave as soon as possible. And so for all of those reasons and the multitude of more that you will hear, especially from business owners, we urge you to give a favorable report to SB 275. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Ms. Martin, for your testimony. Your next witness is Margo Quinlan. Ms. Quinlan? Yep, great. Thank you, uh, Chair Kelly, Vice Chair Feldman, members of the committee. My name is Margo Quinlan. I'm with the Mental Health Association of Maryland, and um, I know you have a long day ahead of you, so I'll be quick, but I do, we really do want to lift up this important intersection of family and medical leave and behavioral health. We know that one in five Americans will experience a mental illness in a given year, and one in five children, either currently or some point during their life, have had a serious debilitating mental illness. The COVID-19 pandemic, as I think we're all very aware, has only further taxed the mental and behavioral health of many Marylanders. 40% of Marylanders report having experienced anxiety or depression as a result of the pandemic, and Black and Brown communities have endured disproportionately higher rates of job loss due to COVID-19. Allowing Maryland workers time to care for themselves and their families during long-term mental or behavioral health treatment or recovery is critical to supporting a strong economy. And at a time when our national economy is still weathering one of the worst public health crises of a generation, we believe it is increasingly critical that we support a healthy and sustainable Maryland workforce. And for these reasons, the Mental Health Association strongly supports uh, Senate Bill 275. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Ms. Quinlan. We're gonna to go to the next witness. Remind all the witnesses you're under the two minute time clock. Next witness is Matt Peterson, Mr. Peterson. Good afternoon. Thank you, uh, Vice Chair Feldman, uh, Chair uh, Kelly, and members of the Finance Committee. My name is Matt Peterson, here on behalf of ba the Baltimore Jewish Council to express our strong support of SB 275, the Time to Care Act. Uh, we're also members of the uh, Time to Care Coalition, Marylanders Against Poverty Coalition, and the Maryland Senior Citizens Action Network. And we just want to represent today, not only the Jewish community, but a broad coalition of faith communities across the state of Maryland. Everyone gets sick. Everyone will need to take time off at some point in their lives. They'll need to care for a child, a loved one, anyone. Uh, everyone needs to have this option available to them. And as we know, as you've heard many times, and I'm sure undoubtedly we'll hear again today, the pandemic has only made this uh, the need for paid leave even more vital. So I just want to, again, urge you all to finally uh, pass this. It is more than time to finally do this and to be a, a leader among states. So uh, I just want to, again, uh, say that I'm here on behalf of the Baltimore Jewish Council and urge a favorable report on the Time to Care Act. So thank you again for your time. Okay, thank you, Mr. Peterson. Our next witness is Philemon Kanchirsky. Kanchirsky. Um, there you go. I think I mucked up your name, but I apologize. Right. Close enough. <laughs> thank you, Vice Chair Feldman, uh, Chair Kelly, and members of the committee. Uh, Phil Kanchirsky here on behalf of the American Council of Life Insurers and the League of Life and Health Insurers of Maryland here in strong support of Senate Bill 275. Uh, we'd like to thank Senator Hayes for introducing this important legislation. Helping workers care for their families and themselves is one of the most critical missions of life and health insurers in Maryland. And the pandemic has only further highlighted the need for paid family medical leave program. Life insurers provide paid family medical leave options to employers and support private sector solutions across the country. And the benefits provided through employer insured partnerships are vital to the health of workers and the financial security of their families. Workers shouldn't be penalized for taking time off to care for their families when needed. ACLI and the League members believe that we must work to find viable solutions that meet this fundamental need across Maryland. We thank that Senator Hayes for including our suggested language that allows proactive companies that exceed the parameters of the paid family medical leave program as proposed to continue to care for their employees in an appropriate manner. For these reasons, we urge the committee to give Senate Bill 275 a favorable report. Thank you. Okay, thank you for your uh, testimony. We're gonna go to the next witness, Laura. Wheel dryer, dryer. It's wheel dryer. 
Good afternoon, Mr. Vice Chair, Madam Chair, and honorable committee members. Thank you so much for the opportunity to testify today. I'm Laura Wheeldryer, Executive Director for Maryland Family Network, which is a statewide nonprofit and a leading voice in early childhood. Today, I'm here to urge your favorable report for the Time to Care Act. It does not matter your age, your race, what region of the state you live in, or your political party. Marylanders agree that paid family and medical leave is a good idea for our state. The last two years have shined a light on how fragile the social structure of this country is and how much the family unit as the fundamental building block of our society is crying out for our attention. Whether your concern is racial and gender justice or the strength of our families, or the work revolution and economic threats, which we are all currently living through, or the healthy development of our future generations. Paid family and medical leave is a policy that helps to address all of these. Maryland Family Network plays a statewide role in speaking on behalf of babies, their parents, and their caretakers. Our constituents need paid family and medical leave. Marylanders face an untenable choice between the families that they love and the jobs that they need. If you need me to today, I am happy to run through the vast public health research about the benefits of time together for babies, for moms, for dads in those weeks and months after a birth or an adoption. But mainly what I wanna say is this is our chance to do what is right, what is needed and what the voters are asking for. Our state needs your bold leadership now. This is your chance to be a caregiver for the state of Maryland and vote to support Time to Care. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we're gonna go to the next witness, Kevin Lindemood. Kevin? Hello, good afternoon. Um, Chairwoman Kelly, uh, Chair Feldman, uh, members of the Senate Finance Committee. Uh, very good to see you, Senator Hayes. Thank you for your leadership. Uh, my name is Kevin Lindemood. I'm the President and CEO of Healthcare for the Homeless. We are Maryland's leading provider of integrated health services and supportive housing for people experiencing homelessness, serving approximately 10,000 different people a year. Really appreciate the opportunity to testify in, in strong support of Senate Bill 275. Um, Healthcare for the Homeless is deeply committed to equitably supporting our staff as whole people. As a nonprofit agency of 250 employees, we've long offered a paid time off and paid parental leave. And we're always looking for ways to provide even greater family and medical leave as envisioned by this particular legislation. All healthy businesses for profit and non need a healthy and sustained workforce over the long term. And this involves so many, as we know, changes in life circumstances. You will hear from employers, of course, who claim that establishing a paid family and medical leave program would negatively impact their bottom line. We've heard the same unfounded fears before. Take, for instance, the fight to raise the minimum wage. Um, we at Healthcare for the Homeless have long indexed our wage floor to the local cost of housing. Currently, no one makes more, uh, any less than $17 an hour right now today. When we established our livable wage floor 20 years ago, so many people told us that we'd go out. We have only grown and become stronger each and every year since. We've similarly found that offering our employees benefits like paid time off, paid parental leave, these things improve retention and job satisfaction. Supporting our workforce leads to greater lo loyalty, increased morale, and longevity in the workplace. If a global pandemic has taught us anything, and many people have mentioned something along these lines, it's that we're all human, we're all vulnerable to illness, and that there is a fine line between the professional and the personal. It's so thin. We know that employees are looking for employers who offer strong benefits so they can care for themselves and their families. In fact, we would have a really hard time recruiting and retaining staff if we did not offer PTO, paid parental leave, livable wages, tuition assistance, professional, professional development, hardship loan programs, and other benefits. Legislation like this will only improve our ability to support our staff. We strongly stand behind the Time to Care Act 
and we urge you to issue a favorable report. Okay, thank you. Thank you for your testimony. We're gonna go next to Christopher Dews. Thank you, uh, Senator Feldman and members of the panel. My name is Christopher Dews and I'm the Senior Policy Advocate for the Job Opportunities Task Force, where our mission, of course, is always to help low-wage workers advance to higher wage jobs. And of course, we support Senate Bill 275 as a means to ensure that hardworking Marylanders can take family medical leave without having to risk their job, paycheck, or financial security. In my research and conversations with relatives and constituents, I discovered that this issue is actually far closer to home than I originally imagined. Namely, with my mother. In 1987, when she gave birth to my oldest brother, there was no FMLA, and as such, she had to hand my brother off to a daycare provider. She mentioned to me repeatedly that she had never cried harder in her life on her way to work. Needless to say, that uh, wasn't a very good work day. Four years later, when I was born, there was also no paid family medical leave program in place, and so she had to choose between staying home, of course, and sticking out in the workforce. Uh, having now been with the company at the time for a about seven or eight years and having proved her worth, she was able to negotiate staying at home uh, to take care of me while working from home long before we had, you know, Zoom calls and things of that nature. She hit numbers that had never been seen before. And so she was, of course, promoted in the company and became branch manager. But that is because she was very privileged and had connections and uh, had been at the company for a long enough time that she was able to earn that worth. Years and years later, uh, really two years ago, uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic, my mother also had to retire early so that she can take care of her mother, my grandmother. I initially thought she just wanted to retire. I then found out that it was mostly because there was no way she could receive a paycheck from her current employer while nursing my grandmother who had become so elderly that she could no longer take care of herself. If we had this bill in place, my mother would not have had the issues that she had with my brother and myself in our birth and would not have had the issues with taking care of of my grandmother, the workforce that she had, I mean, the work that she had would not have been affected. And so looking at this bill now, uh, we, we of course really want to see this sucker pass. We wanna see this, uh, this bill move, it's a good bill. And we think it's gonna be very beneficial to mostly majority women that are really working their butts off in the workforce. For those reasons, we urge a favorable report. Okay, thank you, Mr. Dews. Our next witness is uh, Dasha Johnson. Uh, Ms. Johnson. Uh, hello. Here you go. Okay, good. Thank you. All right. Hello, my name is Daisha Johnson. I live in Maryland, and I'm the operations manager at Well Paid Maids, a living wage home cleaning company with approximately 20 employees, um, most of whom live in Maryland. In my role, I, draw, I hire, train, and manage all of our wonderful employees. I'm very aware of what makes our employees succeed at work and in life and what holds them back. I'm also very aware of what helps the business grow and what creates obstacles in our growth. This is why I'm here to support SB 275, which would address the dire need for paid family and medical leave. I'm confident that having a state public program makes our business stronger and be better for our employees. Originally, our company provided private short-term disability insurance, which had a very difficult process for claims approval did not cover many types of leave and was costly. Since moving to DC's paid, public paid family and medical leave program, our company is now able to provide better coverage at a third of the cost. A Maryland paid family and medical leave program will give businesses like ours the same great coverage through a public program and bring the cost to all businesses down, allowing them to invest more in growth and other employee benefits. We have been around since 2017 and were recently voted best made service in the Washington City Papers Best of DC competition. We serve Maryland, DC and Virginia. All of our employees make at least $20 per hour and everyone receives a full benefits package, including 22 paid days off per year, health, dental and vision insurance and employer paid commuting costs. Our company has reaped tremendous gains by offering the benefits I mentioned. My employees are happy, hardworking and dependable because our benefits package faces the reality of everyday life. People get sick, get injured, and need vacations. By accommodating these facts of life with benefits that recognize them, our employees know that we have their back. In turn, they offer better service to our customers and stay with the firm longer than I believe they otherwise would. To summarize, a strong paid family and medical leave program cut our small businesses' expenses 
increase our revenue and allowed us to invest more in growth so that we can create more living wage jobs in our community. Beyond being the right thing to do, these measures are crucial to helping small businesses like ours recover from the pandemic. And I do hope that you'll support SB 275. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Ms. Johnson. Um, our next signed up witness is Rhonda White, but I um, understand that uh, Ms. White is no longer on the Zoom call. So we're gonna move to uh, Ken Capone, um, familiar face to this committee. Mr. Capone, uh, you are up next. Good afternoon, committee members. My name is Ken Capone. I am the director for People on the Go, which is Maryland's statewide self-advocacy organization. We are here to testify in support of SB 275 Labor and Employment, Family and Medical Leave Insurance Program. People on the Go Maryland builds community through diversity and inclusion. Our beliefs in empowerment and inclusion provide the means by which people with intellectual and or developmental disabilities come together to develop self-advocacy and leadership skills and give voice to the needs of the disability community. As many of you are probably aware, nearly all of us will need to take leave at some point, whether to care for our family members or our own serious medical condition or disability, or the joyous occasion of welcoming a new child. Without access to paid leave, workers often face a difficult and unnecessary decision, health and family, or work and making ends meet. Not now but in the past, my mother had to take off work to care for me if I got sick or my support needs intensified or even longer when I had surgery, I know it was a hardship for us. It would have been nice to have something like this back then. More than 70% of family members caring for a person with intellectual and or developmental disabilities report that caregiving interfered with their work and the odds of an employee losing income increases by 48% if the person lives with a child with disabilities and by 29% if the person lives with and supports an adult with disabilities. That is a significant amount of people experiencing economic hardship. When people having access to dedicated paid family leave, it reduces the odds of losing income by 30%. As more people with intellectual and or developmental disabilities are supported to work, these additional benefits are important. People with disabilities need leave for the same reasons as all other workers and in the U.S. addressing one's own health condition or disability makes up 55% of all leave taken. People with disabilities are more likely to be employed in low-wage, part-time jobs that provide fewer supports. Access to paid leave increases opportunities for people with disabilities so that we can be supported when needs intensify just like I did from time to time. The benefits to people with disabilities and their families are clear. Both the person that is sick and the person that is caring for them have time they need to be together and get or give support. They will be less stressed, which in turn speeds up the healing process. In conclusion, SB 275 gives people with disabilities the comfort of knowing that they shouldn't feel guilty anymore because they may need extra care from a family member from time to time and it won't be a hardship on the family. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Mr. Capone. We're going to go to the next uh, witness is Karen Ray. Ms. Ray? You've got two minutes. Is Ms. Ray in the house? Okay. Trying to find out if she's here and just muted. Okay. Um, we don't see her. Okay, she is no, no longer in the house. We're gonna move uh, to our next witness, uh, Jeffrey Rubin. Mr. Rubin, you're next up, two minutes. Thank you, Vice Chair Feldman. My name is Jeffrey Rubin. I live in Potomac in District 15, and I'm an active member of Jews United for Justice. I support the Time to Care Act. My synagogue, Adat Shalom, also has signed on to the campaign, reflecting the feelings of several dozen members who attended events when it was discussed. As a physician, I know the importance of people taking the time to care for themselves or their loved ones when they're dealing with serious illness. When my father was diagnosed with cancer, I had to take time off for several weeks while he was in a hospital and then an outpatient. 
Happily, I'm also witness to the joy of having new lives enter the world. Following the birth of my two grandchildren, my daughter has had up to four months of maternity leave. And for the second birth, my son-in-law has had paternity leave. The hours of care required for a newborn are stressful enough. Not having to worry about your income or holding your job is a big relief. Our society and economy suffer when paid family and medical leave is not provided. If people are not able to take time off when they need it, health will suffer. If they choose to leave their jobs because of medical necessity, then our labor force will shrink. Our country is one of the few that has failed to address this reality. Businesses would not suffer from this legislation. They would make a very small investment with each pay period. And when employees take time off, their salaries would be available to pay for temporary help or overtime for coworkers. This plan makes sense. And now is the time to make it happen. Thanks for listening. Okay, thank you, Mr. Rubin. Our next witness is Kayla Mock. Uh, Ms. Mock? Is Ms. Mock in the house? Kayla Mock. Okay, Tammy, is, is, is Kayla Mock in the, in the room? She's in, she's just not unmuted. Okay, I've asked Ms. Mock. her to unmute. Okay, uh, Kayla Mock, you gotta unmute yourself. Okay, we'll give you a little short period more and then we'll, we'll come back to you at some point potentially here. So, um, Kayla Mock, last shot here, don't mute yourself. Okay, uh, I think we're gonna just have to move on to the next witness, uh, Christopher Meyer. Um, Mr. Meyer, you're up next, two minutes. Mr. Meyer in the house, I'm muted. Christopher Meyer. Okay. <laughs> we, we don't see him now. Okay, we don't see Mr. Meyer in the house. We're gonna just move on and next witness, Claudia Remington. Miss Remington, are you in the house and are you unmuted? I am in Excellent. the house and I am. Hey, you got unmuted. two minutes. You got two minutes. Two minutes. Thank you. Thank you, Vice Chair, Madam Chair, and distinguished members of the committee. My name is Claudia Remington. I'm the Executive Director of the State Council on Child Abuse and Neglect, or SCAN. SCAN is an, a multidisciplinary advisory body to the Governor and General Assembly and advocates for policies that prevent and mitigate child maltreatment and, and other adverse childhood experience or ACEs. We believe that investing in paid family leave and other policies that support healthy development of our children build a strong foundation for kids and for society. I'll share two key reasons we support paid family leave SB 275. First, it has shown to reduce the leading cause of child, fatal child maltreatment in young children, abusive head trauma. In research comparing California, a state with paid family leave and seven without, paid family leave was linked to fewer cases of abusive head trauma in infants. During the Great Recession, abusive head trauma actually declined in California while rising in other states. Abusive head trauma is often associated with parents' level of frustration and tension with the baby's incessant crying. Both infant crying and abusive head trauma peak at six to eight weeks. So decreasing levels of parental stress during this time with policies such as paid family leave is extremely helpful. Additionally, paid family leave has been linked to preventing other adverse childhood experiences. In preventing ACEs, leveraging the best available evidence, the CDC identifies key policies known to prevent or reduce ACEs and their effects. Paid family leave is among them as it strengthens economic supports for families and ensures a strong start for children. Research shows that parents facing financial hardship are more likely to experience stress, depression, and conflict in their relationships and family. All compromise parenting and increase the risk for violence and other ACEs. Paid family leave protects families from losing income to care for an infant or sick mem family member. It can prevent ACEs by both providing bonding time with an infant and reducing parental stress and depression due to economic concerns. 
strengthening economic supports for families and ensuring strong starts for children are multi-generational strategies that address the needs for both parents and children, ensuring that families succeed and their children achieve lifelong health and well-being. For these reasons, SPAN urges a favorable report on SB 27. Okay, thank you, Ms. Remington, for your testimony. Our next witness is Kara Ashby. Ms. Ashby, we've got two minutes if we can locate you. I'm here. Hi. Okay. Thank you. So you've my got name, two minutes. Thank okay. you. My name is Dr. Doctor, Cara doctor, Ashby. I, I correct Dr. Ashby. It's Dr. okay. Karen. My name is Dr. Kara Ashby, and I represent the Maryland chapter of the American Academy of Pediatrics, which is a statewide association representing over 1,100 uh, pediatricians charged with the role of advocating for health and safety of children that we serve. The MDAAP strongly supports Senate Bill 275. In fact, the early months of a child's life are vital for physical and emotional development. Giving a parent time to stay home with that child during these months provides many benefits to the family. Positive benefits of established family medical leave insurance include effective maternal child and paternal child bonding, attention to child health care needs, particularly if a baby is born premature at low birth weight or with birth defects, increased breastfeeding, which can reduce respiratory tract infections and air infections, as well as the risk of sudden infant death syndrome, reduced rates of childhood obesity, type 2 diabetes, allergies, and asthma, increased involvement in fathers and children's care, improved vaccination completion rates, increased placement in high quality, stable child care, reduced rates of abusive head trauma, otherwise known as shaken baby syndrome, decreased infant mortality, and reduced rates of maternal postpartum depression. For all these reasons, MDAAP strongly urges a favorable report on SB 275. Okay, thank you, Dr. Ashby, for your testimony. Uh, we have one witness signed up favorable with amendment, and we're going to take uh, that witness, and then we can open up questions for anybody on the favorable um, group of witnesses. Matthew Rice, Mr. Rice, you signed up favorable with an amendment. Um, yes, Mr. Vice Chair, members of the Senate Finance Committee, and I'd like to say a special hello to uh, Chairwoman Kelly. Um, my name is Matthew Rice. I am the Director of Public Policy for the ARC of Maryland. The ARC of Maryland is the state's largest advocacy organization advocating for the rights of individuals with intellectual and or developmental disabilities, IDD. Uh, we are here to testify in support of uh, SB 275 with amendments. Um, let's be clear, um, the ARC Maryland strongly believes in the need for paid family and medical leave, uh, but we recognize that uh, the bill as it is currently written um, could have some unintended consequences. Uh, so first and foremost, uh, we would ask that the bill uh, be aligned more closely with um, FMLA. Um, we have a side-by-side -side comparison chart on page three of our written testimony that outlines um, specifically the um, differences between paid uh, FMLA and the proposed legislation. Uh, one thing that is not clear to us specifically is whether or not uh, an individual who is eligible for uh, the 680 hours of leave named within the legislation um, could then uh, go and work for another employer and then would that other employer have to cover that um, you know, that, that leave going forward. So potentially we see that somebody could start a new job and be eligible for leave. So also we are um, Medicaid, all of our 
um, chapter organizations are Medicaid providers. As this committee is well aware, this means that we do not have the option of passing the cost on to the consumer to cover the um, cost of mandates such as this. So we would ask for any uh, legislation of this type that is passed to have supplemental funding increases. Um, there is a real staffing shortage right now. The Department of Health recently uh, came out with data that shows that the DSP vacancy rate is at approximately 30%. Um, again, we support the intent of this legislation, but uh, we recognize that supplemental funding will also be needed for uh, supplemental staffing. I speak from personal experience. I self-direct my um, services. This means I'm the employer of record. I have one staff person, and if he is out for any length of time, I do not get the support and services I require to work and perform other activities. So for all of these, you know, for all of the reasons that the prior speakers outlined, we definitely support the intent of the legislation. I would just strongly urge the committee to take a look at the ARC's written testimony and please consider the um, impact of this legislation going forward. And in the interest of brevity, I invite the committee to reach out to me if necessary. Thank you. Okay, thank you for your testimony, uh, Mr. Rice. And that um, completes the favorable testimony and then the one favorable with amendment by Mr. Rice. So we'll open up questions now um, and then we'll take the unfavorables. We have, just to give you a heads up, we've got 11 witnesses signed up unfavorable and that'll complete the testimony. But we'll, for now, any questions for anybody uh, who spoke on the favorable side of things uh, after the sponsor panel was, had, had, was done with their testimony? Any questions? Okay. Okay, seeing none, we're gonna go to the unfavorables. Um, we're gonna start with Bruce Spencer, Mr. Spencer. Hi, uh, thank you, Vice Chairman, and uh, for the forum being provided for us to have an opportunity to speak. Um, I'll put myself on the clock to try to be respectful here. Um, so I guess I'll probably uh, give you a little bit of a different viewpoint, clearly, because we've had people in favor of the bill. And I'm probably not as unfavorable as a small business center. I own an auto repair shop, Walt Eager Service Center here in Severn. Um, I want to give you a perspective of not only me as a small business owner, but actually speaking on behalf of the entire service industry. Um, one hat that you may or may not have considered so far is simply that 100% of our revenue is derived by us being able to bill out our employees for the services they provide. So if you think about a, a plumber, an electrician, an HVAC contractor that comes to your house, those services and potentially the parts that go with them are simply provided to you and billed by way of the labor that those individuals provide. We have a skilled labor shortage as we all fight behind upon the industry we're in. And I would like you to consider that simply because it's not the 0.75% for me as the employer that's problematic. That's minimal. Um, the perception could be is that, you know, business owners hate taxes and anything that involves a new tax that we will fight it. In my particular case, that's really not the case. The three quarters of a percent, I could deal with that. It's not a problem. But we have four technicians. If one or two of them are out uh, for 12 weeks or more as a period of time, that is revenue that we can't bill. You're talking about compromising potentially 25 or 40 or 50 percent of the revenue for that period of time. The thought of temporary employees is almost non-existent. This is a skilled labor force by way of trades. Again, whether plumber, uh, electrician, these are not temporary positions that we can fill for. So when the person is out for an extended period of time, uh, that really compromises our ability to be in business. So I would like you to consider that. I'll be very brief as an employee hat being put on. Our employees right now don't even match the 4% 401k or participate in a 4% 401k. And I asked them why. They said because the inflation pressures that they're hitting are problematic. So Senator Reedy had said it very well before. 
And I think it had to do with, you know, the idea of an employee having something forced upon them as three quarters of a percent potentially of their income. I just simply look at that and say the nature of employees in general or a person in general, humankind, is I'm paying into this, so I should receive potentially some benefit at a point in time. I would hate to put the hat on of somebody saying, hey, I paid into it, therefore I'm going to get what's coming to me. I don't like to think people think that way, but there are some people who might think that way. And so again, the three quarters of percent is not problematic to me as paying it in. But the revenue compromise for all service trades is paramount. So please consider that as you uh, go through this. Thank you for your time. Okay, thank you, Mr. Spencer. And again, we're going to go through all the unfavorables, then we'll open up to questions. Next up is Mike O'Halloran. Mike? Um... I am here, sir. Okay, you got your two minutes. All right, I appreciate it, uh, Mr. Vice Chairman, as always. And good afternoon, members of the Finance Committee. For the record, I am Mike O'Halloran representing NFIB Maryland here in opposition to Senate Bill 275 this afternoon. Look, a record number of employers are raising their compensation according to NFIB's latest jobs report, nearly 50%, in fact. This being done on the heels of an economic crisis we haven't seen in nearly 100 years. One could safely assume that raise is not limited to wages, nor would it be a jump to realize a leave benefit as generous as what's called for in Senate Bill 275 and all those associated costs, notwithstanding the, uh, the testimony of, uh, of Mr. Spencer, you know, those costs put such a leave benefit, again, as, as encapsulated SB 275, out of reach. So respectfully, I don't understand the advocates' arguments that small businesses who cannot afford to provide paid leave as it stands will now somehow have the money to provide it under SB 275. But still, know that many employers provide paid time off in some shape or form, notwithstanding what they're required to do under the state's paid sick and safe leave law. That law also acknowledges, by the way, the unique circumstances of our smallest businesses. But if we take the sponsor's testimony that the cost to an employee will be $3.62, let's work it out. An employer with 20 employees, for example, is paying $72.40 per week. That equates to $3,764.80 per year if my poor Catholic school math is anything to go by. So that is not a small amount of money. Um, and, and we'll be honest, you know, that, that is a substantial line item and a labor cost that in all likelihood will increase if the experience in other states serves as an example as to the solvency of those funds. The fact is small business owners will do everything they can to accommodate the needs of their employees, especially when it comes to caring for family members in need of palliative care. But when it's shaped and required in such a one size fits all manner as SB 275, that is not something small business owners can afford to do. As for this program being a tool for small businesses, it's not a tool our members want. 80%, in fact, when they were surveyed. The tools they need are improved infrastructure, access to broadband, and affordable and predictable health insurance they can offer their employees. Fixed labor costs like SB 275 can be solved, but the solution is not good for workers or employers. I know my time is up. I respect the committee's time, um, and for these reasons, we were, re, excuse me, re, we request an unfavorable committee report. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Mr. O'Halloran. We're going to go next to Fiona Ong. Um, Ms. Ong, you are up next to testify. Thank you, and thank you for allowing me to speak today. I'm Fiona Ong, and I'm here today at the invitation of the Maryland Chamber of Commerce for whom I serve as general counsel. I'm also a partner at a labor and employment firm that works with Maryland businesses of all sizes. And one area that takes up a lot of my time and attention is employee leave. The bill states that it's creating an insurance program to pro provide benefits for covered leave. And we're not philosophically opposed to this concept. We understand the needs of employees, but the actual language of the bill is unclear as to whether it is truly just providing pay for existing leave, like many other programs in other states, or if it's creating an entirely new bank of paid leave, up to 24 weeks, 12 for the employee's own condition, and an additional 12 for family reasons, with an absolute right to reinstatement, regardless of the employee's misconduct, performance, or economic difficulties for the employer. As drafted, the state takes over the employer's HR function, which is human resources function, which is simply unworkable. The state improves the leave and the employer is forced to accept it. The employer has no ability 
to verify the need for leave, to challenge leave as fraudulent or abusive, or to take into account the impact of the leave. Again, up to 24 weeks on business operations, as Mr. Spencer was talking about. And they must hold the job for that entire time. I've heard from the proponents that they want this to be a leave bill, to make sure that employees have protected leave for certain family and medical reasons. And of course, paid sick leave was passed several years back for this very reason. And I can tell you in my experience, many employers have struggled with the implementation of paid sick leave, particularly the restrictions on verification. But beyond paid sick leave, there are a number of laws that already provide unpaid leave to employees that could be covered by this paid benefit. The Federal Family and Medical Leave Act, leave that's required as an accommodation under the Americans with Disabilities Act and state disabilities law, the Parental Leave Act, which applies to smaller employers, the Pregnancy Accommodations Law, and the Organ Donation Leave Law, among others. But what's critically important about these laws is that all of them balance the leave rights against the needs of employers such as verification, challenging fraud and abuse, no automatic reinstatement, and even denying leave that poses an undue hardship or significantly interferes with business operations. And this is why it's critical to make clear that this is a program, this program should be pay for leave and not a paid leave program. And that is why we request an unfavorable report. Thank you. Okay, thank you for your testimony. Next up is Kirk McCauley. Uh, Kirk, we've got uh, two minutes. Yes. Mr. McCauley. Uh, thank you, Vice Chair Thelman, members of the Finance Committee. Uh, my name is Kirk McCauley, and I represent WMDA uh, CAR. We uh, represent uh, service stations, convenience stores, and repair facilities, all small businesses, all very concerned about this one-size-fits-all bill. Um, and we're in opposition to 275. Uh, they're not only concerned about employee contributions, but the cost of replacement for an employee on leave. Convenience stores that have 24 seven uh, operations will find it impossible to train and hire an employee on a temporary basis. So they'll end up uh, paying a, 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 another employee overtime to work. Uh, the overtime um, plus the, the salary that you're paying would cost $3,600 for 12 weeks of overtime pay. Uh, that's just the overtime portion of that pay. So the employer is going to cost, going to, have to lose an employee, have another employee work a double shift, wore out, and cost him $3,600. That's at $15 an hour. For a service station with bays or repair facility, you have the same cost for office and cashiers, office personnel and cashiers, but a repair technician is another story. Uh, it's like Mr. Spencer said, who's one of our members, that uh, the Technician is paid uh, by the job, and one technician off 12 weeks in a three technician shop would cost the owner 33% of the income per day uh, for every day he's off. Uh, and that's substantial. It's, it's really substantial. Um, if you look at your physical notes in it, it says that by establishing uh, family leave, more employees may take leave and take it for longer periods of time. Well, I think that's going to be a given. I, I don't, I don't see where they'll. But after 17 weeks, 680 hours, an employee making $15 an hour has contributed $38.25 to the program, but he can take off 12 or 24 weeks. That, that just it doesn't make sense. It really doesn't. I don't know uh, uh, whatever happened to earned leave. I guess they call it unearned leave in this in this case. Uh, businesses are struggling now with COVID and all the uncertainty and added cost of a never-ending pandemic. Uh, this bill could be a business killer. Uh, thank you for your time, and I'll be happy to answer any questions. Okay, thank you. Now, our next witness uh, is Chris uh, Costello. Mr. Costello. Is Mr. Costello in the house on the Zoom? He is. I've asked him to unmute. Uh, I keep Okay. Yep. All right. You're good. You got, you got, Chris, you got, you got two minutes. So. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Vice Chair and, and Chair uh, 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 and Chair Kelly. Uh, members of the Finance Committee, uh, Chris Costell, I'm here for uh, the Howard County Chamber of Commerce. Now, the Howard County Chamber of Commerce is not opposed to uh, this idea of uh, the family leave insurance program in concept, 
but um, they've been looking this over carefully and they have a number of concerns that uh, they can't resolve and, and therefore can't support the bill. Uh, and I'm gonna go over them very quickly, but uh, a lot of them have been covered by the people who have already spoken, so I won't repeat any, but uh, the main is concern is the cost. And the cost I would say um, is the additional administrative cost is, is one of the big uh, concerns uh, to employers and, and, and that would result in the passage of this bill. The paid family medical leave insurance places a significant cost on both employers and employees and the anticipated cost to administer this program may be underestimated. Uh, and I, I don't know that it's easy to explain that to people who don't have to administer these programs. Um, but in, all employers in a similar program would be subject uh, to a new administrative and reporting requirements. And this is in addition to the already numerous and burdensome administrative costs associated with the Maryland Healthy Working Families Act, the Maryland Parental Leave Act, and the Maryland Flexible Leave Act. Uh, I would go on to say that uh, they've gone into a number of other things that also bear your attention. That is uh, um, the 24 weeks uh, is, is a big concern to the Howard County Chamber of Commerce. The increase in the implement, impl, implementation time, the, the way this bill is structured, as we can see, you really got six months from the time this, the General Assembly ends when they expect to get this up and running. The relatively short period, not relatively, it's a very short period of time to have everything up and running. And, and that needs to be given a, a great deal of attention. Um, I don't know how that would work, but I was looking over um, the fiscal note and uh, it just seems un unlikely that they've, that the, what they've estimated the cost to be uh, and, and the problems are going to be, I think uh, you probably can't expect all this to run as smoothly as, as you would like. And, and that's not a criticism. That, that's just saying, we know how these things go. It's gonna be run by the Department of Labor. Um, we know they're already having a lot of problems with unemployment insurance. And, and basically this is unemployment insurance two. Uh, and it may not be as large as unemployment insurance. I would hope not. It hopefully it won't have the abuses that unemployment insurance is experiencing now. We don't know and hope not, but uh, you starting up a new agency basically and Hey, Mr. Costello, could you maybe yeah, bring and, some closure? And so, Lo and by yeah, right past third continue. Thank you very much. And we would we would like to see some more oversight on this. But um, unfortunately, the, the chamber can't see their way to support this bill, and therefore they have to oppose it. Okay, thank, thank you. you for your testimony, Mr. Uh, Mr. Costello. We're going to next go to Kaylee Locklear. Uh, Kaylee, um, are you here? I am here. Good afternoon, Mr. Yeah. Vice Chairman. And just honorable. reminder, too, we're under the two minute clock. Just Understood. Got it. Okay. <laughs> um, so, uh, Kaylee Locklear, on behalf of the Maryland Retailers Association, a respectful opposition to this bill, a couple of points to make. Um, so, first, as a reminder, the task force <clears throat> that you chaired back in 2017 looked at an employee paid fund. And in fact, five of the states that do have paid family and medical leave are in fact employee paid. And this has been one of our biggest issues with this policy since our conversations began. But unfortunately the bill before you is still written as a split tax. Uh, we would also want to see the definition of family member and employer eligibility align more with FMLA. This bill does allow for up to 24 weeks of leave in some instances, which raises concerns about solvency. We prefer to see a 12 week annual cap for total leave. As you've heard, there are significant challenges to someone being gone uh, that long in general. And as this committee is aware, there are actually more job openings in the state of Maryland than human beings that we have to work in them. So the more leave that's provided, that is going to exacerbate that problem. We'd also wanna push out implementation. We've seen states, Washington and Massachusetts, for example, make last minute changes to the program. And that makes it really difficult for employers to prepare for implementation. 
And for what it's worth, Delaware, our neighbors are considering and likely to pass a paid family and medical leave bill that is much closer to the Family and Medical Leave Act, and it is more employer friendly. And as further proof of the importance of implementation date and solvency issues we've been bringing up, Washington State's fund is likely to hit a deficit next month. Not only is a program ex extremely expensive to set up, look at the fiscal note, it's $20.8 million, but solvency is a real issue. Uh, they've had to introduce a piece of legislation there to add state funds to the program because they've repeatedly increased the tax and there's so much pushback on that. So for these reasons, we continue to oppose this legislation, but are glad to work with the committee on this. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Ms. Locklear, for your testimony. We're gonna next move to uh, Paul Fry. Uh, next up, Mr. Fry, two minutes. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Mr. Vice Chair, uh, Madam Chair, and members of the Finance Committee. Paul Fry, President and CEO of the Washington County Chamber of Commerce. We represent 575 member organizations and 40,000 employees. We are opposing Senate Bill 275 for the reasons outlined in my written testimony, in addition to the following concerns. As was noted, uh, the bill's fiscal notes indicate an additional $21 million a year to implement and administer this program annually. This includes hiring 80 more employees at the state level. Uh, it is also cost to municipalities and state government to implement this program. And all this leads and impacts taxpayers in Maryland. Uh, the impact in particular on small businesses and nonprofits will be significant. Uh, most of our small businesses and nonprofits are so focused on surviving and keeping their doors open. Uh, and so despite our outreach that we've done for two years, Many of them either don't know, they aren't aware of the legislation, or if they're aware of it, they don't understand the impact on them. Earlier, Ms. Vaughn from Catholic Charities noted that there are legitimate concerns regarding the burdensome administrative issues and cost issues to business nonprofits. We agree. We propose the establishment of a new legislative work group uh, this summer to work and discuss uh, the issues both sides have regarding this proposed legislation. Um, our proposal is to work together. Let's collaborate. Let's get this legislation right for everybody. So we respectfully ask for an unfortunate or unfavorable report on S Bill, uh, Senate Bill 275, and we thank you for your consideration. Okay, thank you for your testimony, Mr. Fry. We're going to next go to Andrew Griffin. Mr. Griffin. Good afternoon, Mr. Vice Chairman, uh, Madam Chair, members of the committee. For the record, Andrew Griffin here on behalf of the Maryland Chamber of Commerce uh, in opposition to Senate Bill 275. Uh, I will refer you to my written testimony, which is quite lengthy, uh, detailing the Chamber's opposition to this. Um, but I do want to say the Chamber is not opposed to a paid family leave program. However, we are opposed to the Senate Bill 275 that you have as introduced in front of you. Um, it is extremely problematic for employers of all sizes. Um, I don't want to belabor too many points that have been made, but I do want to drive this point home. This bill provides for up to close to six months of paid leave without an employer reserving any right to manage that leave. It is completely certified and granted by the state. So for a small employer, you can have up to uh, all, all employees potentially being out for up to six months paid, 12 for them, 12 for the employee, 12 for a family member. Uh, that, that is untenable. Uh, this would be the only federal or state program to, to allow that. Um, and so I, I do want to drive that point home. That absolutely must be fixed before we talk about any additional paid family leave program. The employer must have a role um, in that sense. The cost of the employer has is, is obviously been talked about. There is an obvious direct cost here in the contribution, but also the cost, as you heard from, from Mr. Spencer, uh, of, of employees being out for such a long period of time. Temporary employees, they're, they're not easy to come by. Regular employees are not easy to come by right now. With that, um, I, I would just kind of I will conclude. My last point will be uh, I was interested to see this year in the fiscal note, there was some level of analysis done, which we have been asking for the last several years, uh, to what the expectation level of uh, average, average benefit payment per year, average number of weeks that a benefit would be claimed. We're very happy to see that. But as has been mentioned in, in some of the solvency issues in other states, if this is a program that, that Maryland is going to do. 
we really have to have some level of objective actuarial analysis done to the fund level. Unlike unemployment insurance, which this is compared to often, there is no lender of last resort here if the state runs out of money. Uh, it's got to come from somewhere else. The federal government's not going to provide it. Uh, so we would like to see that. Uh, with that, I will conclude. I will say, listen, we've continued to work with the proponents of the legislation. We will continue to do that. Uh, but at this point, uh, we, we would like to um, urge an unfavorable report on Senate Bill 275, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Okay, thank you, Mr. Griffin. Next up is uh, Christine Walters. Ms. Walters? I am here. Uh, Vice Chair Feldman, Chair Kelly, committee members, Senator Reedy, thank you all. My name is Christine Walters. I'm also here at the invitation of the Maryland Chamber. You have my six pages of written testimony, 14 concerns, five alternatives. So in summary, I actually count 10 states plus DC that um, currently have a paid family medical leave law that covers private sector employers. One of the 10 is a voluntary program. Five of the 10 are fully funded by an employee tax as Ms. Locklear pointed out and the remaining four exempt small employers. That would make Maryland the only state to impose this type of mandatory payroll tax. Couple of concerns, a covered individual, as already mentioned by um, Fiona Ong, may receive up to 24 weeks of paid leave, and that's, those 24 weeks, more than any of the 10 states currently require except Massachusetts. In addition, those 24 weeks are not required to run concurrently with any other form of leave except family medical leave. Maryland employers are currently subject to up to 13 different kinds of paid and unpaid leave, 11 of which cover one or more reasons currently covered under Senate Bill 275. So for example, take a small employer, 15 employees in Montgomery County. That employer might have to offer six weeks of parental leave, followed by 24 weeks of leave under this bill, followed by another two weeks of sick and safe leave under Montgomery County's um, law. So that's a total of 32 weeks in a year, 61.54% of a full-time employee's scheduled work time. In addition, the bill is drafted, does not permit an employer to require an employee to use employer-provided sick leave. Um, so an employee could take 24 weeks of paid leave, come back to work, have a full paid leave bank, and then go out on paid sick leave fully funded by the employer. So we can't um, offset or reduce our accounts payable liability while we're concurrently being taxed. So for those reasons and many more, I ask you to please give Senate Bill 275 an unfavorable report at this time. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Ms. Walters, for your testimony. We're going to next go to Russell Lacey. Mr. Lacey. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, and thank you, Mr. Vice Chair, for allowing me this opportunity to speak in front of the Senate Finance Committee. My name is Russell Lacey. I own a small business, electric advisors, commercial energy brokers, and I'm also here representing uh, as the elected head of the Greater Bethesda Chamber of Commerce. While we appreciate the intent of the proposed legislation, we're respectfully in opposition to Senate Bill 275 for many of the same reasons that have been talked about already. So I will try not to go over them and give back some time to the committee. We do have concerns about timing of legislation. While we're hopefully on the back end of the COVID-19 pandemic, I can assure you that some of my clients, my friends, businesses are still suffering and barely hanging on and three quarters of a percent increase in their monthly obligation over their employee base could be the nail that uh, puts their businesses in the coffin. Employers cannot afford full-time HR professionals, employment attorneys to be able to navigate the current mandated local and state mandated leave laws, including potentially this one. The bill also takes the employer, it has been talked about before, out of the equation. When an employee seeks paid leave, it's defined in this legislation. In Senate Bill 275, the state makes all the decisions about leave without any input from the employer. The employer has no ability to verify the need for leave, nor is any consideration given for the impact of that leave on a business, small or large. For these reasons, we respectfully, we respectfully request an unfavorable, uh, unfavorable vote Thank you for the opportunity to provide comments. Thank you, Mr. Right. Lacey. Uh, so, Mr. Mr. Yes. Vice Chair. Yes. I would like to ask you and all these great people who testified and everybody's done a great job. 
if they would mind are not going longer because there are six other bills to be heard from scratch. Madam Chair, Madam yeah. Chair, th that actually is our last witness, uh, Mr. Lacey. So okay. actually, uh, we had one other witness signed up, Kenneth Stein. That person is not here. He's not here. So that actually finishes up the unfavorables. So we'll now take questions simply for the unfavorables, and then we'll be uh, done with the bill. Well, that's what I was hoping yeah. we could do. Is the, Correct. the unfavorables are largely members of professions who testify five frequently. They know how to find us all and the sure. sponsor. And yeah. I wonder, guys, if in light of the fact that their people have been waiting who in their six other bills, if you would mind uh, you've given us good advice on all sides, uh, working with the sponsor and the co-sponsors uh, and um, not asking more verbal questions at this time. So that other people have been waiting and will need to, in some cases, maybe to wait another three or four hours to get heard, uh, could be heard. Mr. Uh, uh, sponsor. Madam Chair, happy to work with um, anyone on either side to work on those issues later. Thanks so much. It's been a very interesting and very informative uh, hearing all together. And thanks, Mr. Chair. And I know you've okay. got to go testify. No, no, well, so uh, members of the committee, I, I think you got some guidance from the chair. I mean, that concludes the uh, testimony for today. And absent some compelling uh, set of questions for the group of unfavorables, uh, I think Chair Kelly was suggesting that we might want to move on to the next bill. But uh, that concludes the actual testimony so far for today. Any final question for any uh, particular member on the unfavorables? And otherwise, we'll move on to the next bill. Okay. I appreciate it. Uh, Madam Chair. Uh, no, that's, that's all good. So that will conclude the bill hearing on Senate Bill uh, 275. And with that, Madam Chair, I'm going to turn it, give it back to you now uh, the gavel, so you can take it uh, from here on to the next bill, okay? Okay, thank you. Uh, we're going next to Senate Bill 224, Labor and Employment, Employment Standards and Conditions Definition of Employer. Um, this is the President's bill, and uh, we will uh, take the time that's needed for the um, uh, official explanation of what the bill does, and then two minutes each for all other presenters. I believe the Attorney General is going to represent uh, the um, need for the bill and the way it works, the modalities. And so welcome, uh, Attorney General Brian Frost. Thank you very much, Madam Chair and committee members. Pleasure to be with you. I will try to make this as brief as I possibly can. Uh, this is a bill that will harmonize the definition of employer in two sections of Maryland law, in the Maryland Wage and Hour Law and the Maryland Wage Payment and Collection Law. And our Court of Special Appeals has uh, has decided that those the two definitions are to be interpreted the same way. But unfortunately, several federal judges have interpreted them differently from the Court of Special Appeals and also differently from some of their colleagues. The bill is about uh, wage theft. It's a widespread problem uh, in Maryland, and it's due in part uh, to the increased use of outsourcing in the workplace. Companies that used to hire their employees directly now have labor brokers or staffing agencies uh, do it for them. And these intermediaries are often undercapitalized. And as, as a result, the workers in these highly outsourced sectors who are largely low wage workers are vulnerable to wage theft with large numbers not getting paid overtime minimum wage or back wages uh, that are owed at termination. And um, the, the, there are slightly different de uh, definitions in our Title III of the, uh, of the two uh, subtitles that I mentioned to you, the Maryland Wage and Hour Law, the Maryland uh, Payment and Collection Law. Um, and uh, they have resulted in, and I'll give you just uh, two quick examples. Uh, two federal court decisions or several federal court decisions 
where uh, the courts have decided that the uh, employer uh, is not, the ultimate employer is not responsible when the intermediary stiffs the workers. In one case, Duras versus Verizon, Verizon, plaintiffs were laborers who were installing exclusively fiber optic cables for Verizon. And uh, their daily work included digging trenches, installing pipes, filling trenches, cementing over the newly laid cable. They worked an average of 12 to 16 hours a day, five to six days a week, and their wages were stolen. Their paychecks were withheld for the first week of work. They were paid for only 10 hours of work per day, regardless of how much they worked, and they weren't, uh, they weren't paid overtime. Taxes were withheld from their paychecks, but never remitted to the government. Now, Verizon trained these employees. Uh, they issued photo ID cards to these employees, and Verizon supervisors uh, were present when they were working and they issued orders, and the court still found that under the Maryland Wage Payment and Collection Law, uh, Verizon wasn't responsible when its intermediary uh, walked away and, and stole these folks' uh, wages. Another example of federal court decision is uh, Jennings versus Rapid Response Delivery. Plaintiffs were employed as drivers for rapid response, um, but they worked exclusively for Maryland Tire, a tire delivery company. And Maryland Tire set their wages, set their hours. They had functional hiring and firing authority. The plaintiffs weren't paid any overtime despite working more than 40 hours a week, weren't provided breaks during long shifts, arbitrary fees were deducted from their paychecks. And when rapid response, the intermediary, uh, went belly up and didn't pay the, uh, the workers, the federal court held that uh, the definition of employer under the wage payment and collection law uh, didn't fit and the workers were uh, stuck. And the very simple purpose of this bill is to harmonize the two definitions. So the statute is so clear that even a federal court judge can understand it. Uh, it'll protect our workers. It's fair uh, to, to everybody concerned, and we hope you'll give this bill a favorable report. Thank you. Are there questions? I think the Attorney General has done a good job of explaining a situation that sounds like uh, something we all care about and need to work on right away. Uh, thank you, Mr. Attorney thank General. Thank you, Madam Chair. All right. Now um, we have uh, Dave, uh, let's see, uh, David R Rodwin, Public Justice Center will be. Thank you very much, Madam Chair, um, Mr. Vice Chair, members of the committee. Uh, my name is David Rodwin and I'm an attorney at the Public Justice Center in our Workplace Justice Project, uh, which aims to ensure that working people in Maryland are paid what they've earned. Uh, we support SB 224 um, and the sponsor amendments. As the Attorney General described, uh, wage theft of underpaid low wage workers is a major problem. In Maryland alone, a recent study estimated minimum wage violations deprive 580,000 Maryland workers of $875 million in wages each year. It's nearly a billion dollars in unpaid wages, just minimum wage. So these are the lowest paid uh, workers uh, annually, every year. In our experience, wage theft is especially common when companies outsource labor through staffing agencies and subcontractors. Let me give just one example of the many such cases we see at the Public Justice Center. A large transportation company subcontracts with a smaller one. The drivers work 12 hour days, but are paid just $3 or $4 an hour despite working 60 hours or more every week. The larger company trains the workers, tells them where to go, tracks their hours, is their employer in every way, except it isn't the one signing the checks. The smaller subcontractor does that. When the workers sue for unpaid wages, the smaller company folds and the owner disappears. Under the wage payment and collection law, as um, some courts are interpreting it, these workers are denied justice. 
This is a modest bill that provides a technical fix that would ensure that the same law is applied the same way in state and federal courts. State law, um, state courts are already applying the law in the way that this bill would require all courts do. Uh, it applies a standard that already exists in seven other laws in Title III of Maryland's Labor and Employment Article, uh, and which, as I mentioned, state courts already apply to this law, the Wage Payment and Collection Law. Uh, and with that, uh, we ask for a favorable report on SB 224. Thanks very much. Thank you. Any questions for this witness? All right, we'll go next to Sally De Deborah Fisher, National Employment Law Pro Project. Uh, you need to unmute. Yeah, I was stuck a little. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, good afternoon. Madam Chair, members of the committee, my name is Sally Dwarak Fisher, and I am senior attorney at the National Employment Law Project, which is a nonprofit advocacy organization whose mission is to build a just and inclusive economy. We urge a favorable report on SB 224 for all the reasons stated in our written and written testimony, which you should have. But I'm just going to touch on two basic reasons. First, as Attorney General Frosch pointed out, SB 224 promotes accountability for wage theft in today's increasingly outsourced economy. Wage theft is a serious problem to begin with, but it's made all the worse when businesses can outsource their core function and immunize themselves from accountability to their workforce. Too frequently, labor service contractors or other middlemen violate the law, but then they are virtually judgment proof. And too often, the host company, the company that for whose benefit the work is performed and that controls the workers' wages and working conditions cancels its contract, leaving the unpaid workers without any remedy. SB 224 would promote accountability and help ensure that workers who are denied their earned wages have a meaningful remedy under the wage payment and collection law. Second, SB 224 promotes university, uni, promotes uniformity and clarity in Maryland's wage laws. SB 224 provides just a simple clarification to ensure that the definition of employer in the wage and hour law matches the definition of the wage payment and collection law. This change will help avoid any possible confusion by creating absolute consistency among Maryland's two primarily, primary wage laws. And it does so using a well-established definition that's been interpreted through decades of statutes, de decades of case law. And the definition is intentionally broad. These are remedial statutes, but it is not limitless. It's a definition, a standard that's well-known and very practical. In fact, as the Attorney General mentioned, Maryland's appellate court has already applied this standard in the context of the wage payment and collection law. However, certain federal courts have misinterpreted and narrowed the definition uh, contrary to the way it should be interpreted. So as, as Mr. Rodwin mentioned, SB 224 just simply really ensures that the wage payment and collection law matches the definition of the wage and hour law and is consistent with the remedial purposes of those acts. So for the reasons stated, and again, in our written testimony, the National Employment Law Project strongly urges a favorable report. Thank you. Thank you. Are there questions of this witness? All right, then we'll go next to Mike O'Halloran of NFIB. Good afternoon, Madam and Chair. He, and uh, he is unfavorable. Okay. Yes, uh, uh, I can hold off if... if no, go ahead. Oh, okay, all right. Uh, good afternoon, Madam Chair. Uh, good to see you and members of the Finance Committee again. My name is Mike O'Halloran here representing uh, NFIB in Maryland in opposition to Senate Bill 224. And while it may be straightforward uh, change to the law on its face, um, the fact is SB 224 presents and creates a complicated situation that NFIB is concerned will make it harder on small businesses, specifically those in franchise agreements. If 224 passes, our worry is the cost for those licenses uh, for which franchisees and franchisers uh, have a business relationship. The, the cost of those licenses goes through the roof. Why? Because the franchisor would have increased liability. They need to account for that. That costs money. That means a small business owner who operates, uh, pick, a, pick your favorite name brand sandwich shop, 
uh, pick a favorite name brand uh, hotel, those operators will have to pay much more for the privilege to operate. The would-be entrepreneur that wants to open up that restaurant or hotel is now looking at higher licensing fees. In the end, that means less jobs, less of your constituents getting higher, and less economic opportunity. Our members believe that an honest day's work deserves an honest day's pay. There is no excuse, and certainly we do not defend the actions of unscrupulous employers. Instead, we want to ensure the small business owner that is playing by the rules is not faced with higher costs of doing business. For these reasons and these reasons alone, we request an unfavorable report. Thank you. Thank you. And then we're going to Ellen Valentino. Uh, thank you and good afternoon, Madam Chair. My name is Ellen Valentino. and I'm here today representing the Mid-Atlantic Petroleum Distributors. I did not submit my amendment. Um, the House Economic Matters Committee defeated this bill on Tuesday. Um, and um, I actually, quite honestly, thought that the hearing was um, going to be withdrawn. Um, but I do want to make my points and I do plan to submit amendment if this committee is going to entertain moving forward. I again share the concerns Mike O'Halloran has raised regarding um, franchisee, franchisor, and also uh, distributor of uh, petroleum and the relationship with the service station. Um, these are the kind of things we've put forward to the Attorney General with a clear exemption uh, these are small business owners um, based on the testimony from the House, but I know this is the Senate, uh, based on the testimony in the House, these were not issues that were raised um, at the table by the proponents at the time. So in short, if this committee is going to move forward, um, uh, we are going to submit our amendment. And again, I do want to stress that um, the bill uh, was defeated um, uh, and uh, not by, you know, uh, there, there, there was a margin of um, uh, error. Uh, so, so I did want to put that on the table. Thank you. Uh, I'm glad you notifying us. Well, let me say that there, some uh, irregularity has obviously occurred and uh, we, it is the fact of life and the fact of law that we've got two conflicting laws, a state and a federal law impacting wages of Marylanders and it has it would be unconscionable for us to go another year. In fact, we've got written testimony, a lot from organized labor and from chambers of commerce all supporting this legislation. They didn't come in person, but they sent it. I guess they assumed it was going to be a slam dunk. Now, so, thank you. I will so submit yours our and comment. Mr. O'Halloran's are the uh, major um, that we ha have unfavorable. I mean, you've got a right to be unfavorable. You're representing whomever you represent. Sure. So I think we'll have to get with the house and figure out how to resolve the problem. If, uh, but thank obviously you. none of us would want another year sure. to go back. No, and thank you, Marylanders in this quagmire. Thank you, I appreciate, appreciate that. And I know there was a host of opposition in the house, so I'll make sure that they get that testimony to your committee as well. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Okay. All right, that's it on that bill. Okay, we're going next to Senate Bill 322, Senator Kagan, uh, Gas Price Gouging Act. Thank you so much, Madam Chair. For the record, Cheryl Kagan, very proud to be the Senator for Gaithersburg and Rockville. I am back with this bill again, because I don't know how you could have a 90 day session without me on this bill here. Um, Madam Chair, you remember Senator Ida Rubin and year after year after year after year, she came before the Senate urging for public safety, for the safety of our roadways that we require covered trucks. And she kept failing. And you know what? She finally got trucks being covered as the law of the land and our roadways are safer. And now I don't know about you, but if I see a truck that's not covered, I notice it and I am astonished by that. It is the law that needed to be passed. I am suggesting for your consideration that this is similar, but in, a, in but bait and switch, but it is a law that should be passed. AAA submitted testimony this year um, about my gas price gouging bill. And yes, I used to call it gas price clarity because it's about transparency, but this is about gouging our consumers. Let me just start by saying that the two things 
that public surveys show that most infuriate Americans and Marylanders are the cost of their food that has been rising due to supply chain shortage and the cost of their gasoline. And in Maryland, our law exacerbates that problem. Why is that? Because in Maryland, by law, our gas stations are required to post the lowest price, not the accurate price, not the credit card price that roughly 90% of Marylanders choose when buying their gasoline. According to AAA, only 4%, 4, 4 of Marylanders are using cash to pay to fill their gas tanks. Um, five to 7% of American income is spent on gasoline. That's a lot. And they are infuriated when they go in with a big sign that's illuminated. And my early Valentine's Day gift to you all is I'm not going to, Senator Reedy, you've never gotten to see my PowerPoint, but it's great. And I'm happy to share it with you since you're new to finance. Um, but uh, the huge illuminated numbers that, that advertise the price of gas is the cash price. And that is by law. And that is the price that roughly 4% of our constituents will be paying. The reality is that when they pull in and turn off their ignition and put the tank, the nozzle in their, in their gas tank, the price will go up five, six, 10 cents, or as Senator Jennings taught us two years ago, 25 cents, a whopping 25 cents per gallon uptick that the consumer did not know when she or he pulled in and chose that gas station. This bill simply says, post facts, don't do a bait and switch. Post, post the price that most Marylanders are going to pay and that is the credit card price or post both. Post the cash and the credit card price, but do it equally. Both of them large, both of them the same color font, both of them illuminated so that folks can make an educated decision. Now, unlike buying, I don't know, a fancy new toy of some sort, people aren't gonna be able to opt out of buying gasoline. If they have a car and they need to use it, they need to put gasoline in their car. The only thing it will help them do is pick a gas station whose price is a little bit lower so they can pay for this increased cost in their groceries. And they can pay their increased costs in everything that they're dealing with right now as, as working families are struggling with inflation. Truly folks, this is not complicated. Now, there is a cynical explanation that was given to me years ago which is especially in an election year, and I am not um, ignorant of the fact that I am bringing this bill in an election year. And if we wanna make this go into effect down the road to lighten the load or protect us politically or whatever you wanna do, I've heard, oh, but the gas station owners put up my lawn signs, my campaign signs, and so I don't wanna tick them off. There is no additional cost to a small business owner or a large business owner that's selling gasoline to our constituents. Instead of putting up price X, the cash price that 4% of our constituents are gonna pay, they're gonna just change that number, which they do all too often, to the actual price, the price that they will be paying if they use a credit card as roughly 90 something percent of folks do. Others use a debit card. So um, there is, uh, endorsement from the Auto Consumer Alliance, from the Attorney General, bless his heart, the Consumer Protection Division comes in every year advocating this. Um, AAA, uh, which is steadfast in supporting our drivers and the Consumer Relations uh, uh, Commission, the Mar Maryland Consumer Rights Coalition. The last thing I will say, um, there are folks that, that are um, objecting to this and saying it puts an unfair burden on, uh, or that not enough people have complained to the attorney general. I think the average Marylander just gets ticked off. They just feel frustrated. They feel ripped off, um, but that doesn't lead them 
to run home and look up the phone number or the email address for the attorney general of the state of Maryland in order to file a complaint because they were charged an extra couple bucks. But I can tell you when I bring this up at public events, you can watch the visceral reaction in every room. They're like, yeah, I hate that. That really ticks me off. And it happens every time. I beg you all, don't make me be Ida Rubin. I don't look good in a bun. Uh, for those of you who remember Ida Rubin, she was known for wearing a bun. Uh, I don't wanna be Ida. I don't wanna bring this bill back every year. It's modest. It's about transparency, honesty, and accuracy. Let's do right by the consumers with no burden on our small businesses, on our gas station owners, and they're gonna cry poverty and they're gonna cry all sorts of thing in their testimony, oral and written. I'm not buying it. I'm buying gas. I'm not buying their woe. So thank you so much for your, for your attention, colleagues. I really hope we can move the Gas Price Gouging Act and return honesty to our gas price purchases in Maryland. Thank you. Thank you. Senator Hershey has a question. Madam Chair, just a quick, I wasn't going to ask a question, but the Senator brought up something. You mentioned going out to these public here you know, events where you talk about it and you hear that people are so frustrated um, with being ripped off. Did you ever ask them why do they keep going back to the same service station that ripped them off the first time? Totally great question, Senator Hershey, thank you. Um, there aren't gas stations on every corner in most districts and most neighborhoods. So I know that I go to places that are less expensive and there's a place that I go to that only accepts cash and I never carry cash. But I know when my tank is getting low, I make sure I go to an ATM or I get cash and I walk up with my 20 bucks or 25 bucks and I drive efficient vehicles. And so I know that that's less than a lot of people pay when they fill their tank. And I go to a cash only price so that I get ripped off. Um, other people make other choices. And frankly, for our affluent constituents, maybe they don't care if it's an extra five, 10 or 25 cents per gallon every single time they fill up their tank. But for some hardworking Marylanders, that little bit makes the difference. And it makes a difference in order the, to get healthy foods in their grocery uh, carts and, and pay their bills on time. Everything <laughs> adds up and we gotta be able to help them cut corners by at least letting them make the choices and not be subject to bait and switch tactics. Right, and that's the, the your bill is talking about the the bait and switch and the and and the gouging. But if you go to the same gas station all the time and you realize that the price is going to be more than what's what's listed, it's not bait and switch and gouging gouging anymore. You've now made the decision to go there, knowing that that price is going to be higher. Isn't that right? It depends on where I am. So I'm not just filling my gas tank in Rockville at the Free State on 355 where I know I'm paying cash and the price is the price and that's what I'm gonna pay. So it could be that I drive to Kent County to see my friend, Senator Hershey. And I stop at a gas station that looks like it's inexpensive. And then I put my credit card in the tank and holy crap, it goes up by 12 cents or something. Ticks me off and I'm the weirdo who will actually cancel the transaction put the nozzle back in my tank, if I'm uh, back in the, in the tank uh, and, and leave just on principle. I've done that only a few times and I'm usually in too much of a hurry, but people have to make choices. Consumer choice is what's critical here. And I, think I agree, they, they get to make choices. To make the decisions, right. Yeah. Let's give and them that, the data so that they can make that choice, Senator Hershey. I think Thank they can you. make the choice already if they decide they wanna to go to that gas station or not. And, and I would also say, I think most people, many people use the same service stations over and over again. Okay. So if you are taking the commute that I do, there's probably two or three gas stations that I know that pretty much I'm always going to go to. So I, I don't know that there's this big surprise element anymore. And again, I feel that if they've gone there once and they feel that they were ripped off, then they certainly have the opportunity not to go there again. So, thank okay. Thank you. Thanks. <laughs> All right, we're going next to Fran Schneiderman, the con uh, consumer auto. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Senator Kagan, uh, Chair, Chair Kelly, for the chance to address the bill. I'm Fran Schneiderman with Consumer Auto. We work for safety, fairness, and transparency for Maryland drivers. 
I had Senator Kagan explained, yeah, this bill is about transparency and price transparency for car consumers. You know, for a lot of things drivers have to purchase, like car insurance, like buying the car itself, there's a lot of issues parts of the transaction that aren't very transparent. Car prices are hard to read. Car insurance is difficult to get competing quotes. But for, you know, car pr gas prices seem to be like they should be a very transparent thing. We, we have big rules that require big signs that tell you what the price should be. But, you know, of course, they omit the fact that people usually don't pay the cash price or the lowest price. And, you know, I go to the discount places in North Baltimore, and I'm one of those cost-conscious people who usually pays in cash. But it's true that if you if you don't if you pay in credit, you're going to pay eight, ten, twelve cents more a gallon. And if you haven't been there before, or you're not paying attention, you could pay considerably more at each fill up without really know, knowing what you were getting into before you start the transaction. So you know, I think it's a simple transparency question. I did notice reviewing the statute. Before the hearing, 10315, I mean, we regulate the signage in some detail about the relative size of the numerator and the denominator, all in what I think is a laudable effort to make these prices clear and transparent to consumers. But we have this big sort of gap there where we don't requ we only require them to list the lowest price. And so we're not achieving the transparency we hope we would we're we're trying to achieve. So Support the bill. Hope you'll give it a favorable report. And happy to take questions. Okay. Thank you. We're going next to Kurt McCauley, uh, Lamada Carr, unfavorable. Thank you, Chair Kelly. Uh, members of the Finance Committee, my name is Kurt McCauley, and I represent uh, WMDA uh, service stations and convenience stores. Uh, I have a submitment written, and I have some detail in there. And, uh, this bill is a uh, is looking for a problem that doesn't exist. I believe when you get one complaint for every five million six hundred ninety nine thousand transactions, there's no problem. Uh, those complaints come from uh, the control of the comptroller's office and uh, weights and measures. Uh, that's the number on the pump you can call if you have a problem, and. Uh, they speak for themselves. Uh, bad actors don't last long in our business. You don't have to go to any station. There's over 2,100 of them in Maryland and uh, no, no one's forced by gas from any one of them. Uh, thank you. We urge you for an unfavorable report and uh, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Okay, next is Taylor Locklear, Maryland Retailers Association. Good afternoon again, Madam Chair and honorable members of the committee, Kaylee Lockbear here on behalf of the Maryland Retailers Association in opposition to this bill. So I hate to sound like a broken record, but I ask this question of the committee every year, and it's not just the price of gasoline. When you go to purchase something, what consumers are most interested in is not the highest price that they could pay for an item. It is truly the lowest price. And I speak to members about this every year. I try my best to observe existing signage in my own community. And the members that we represent are clearly displaying the price and the method of payment. But I want to mention the larger issue here, which is why retailers are offering a cash or credit price. And it's different. And that is be the direct result of debit and credit card swipe fees. So the more expensive credit card price reflects gas station owners trying to cover the cost of what banks, credit card companies, and processors charge them each time a customer is using their card to pay for gas. Essentially, and although there are some out there, many retailers have existing signs that cannot hold both cash and credit prices. So essentially, this bill would force these retailers into paying for new signs that can be incredibly costly. And finally, and this is mentioned in the fiscal note, non-compliance for this law carries very steep penalties. Failure to comply with the provisions related to the sale of motor fuel in this state is not just a misdemeanor, but a fine and upwards of $5,000. So with that, we would urge a unfavorable report. Thank you. Okay. 
Next, we will hear from Ellen Valentino. Uh, thank you and good afternoon. My name is Ellen Valentino. I'm here today representing the Mid-Atlantic Petroleum Distributors, and um, uh, this might be the first today. I do have nothing to add. We've submitted our comments, and uh, the points were well uh, provided from Kirk McCauley and uh, uh, Kelly Locklear. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. That ends all of the oral testimony. Madam, Madam Chair, hey, yeah, Madam Chair I just one question, I, sure. if you don't mind. I, and this may be for uh, Ellen or Kaylee. I, one thing that kind of always comes up about this differential between cash and credit cards, I think we, since we have had this bill before, is like why at the grocery store you don't have a differentiation when you show up at the cash register and there's no separate price for the bread or milk or like why is that? Is there a reason or explanation? Just kind of a curiosity, I guess. So I would actually say sometimes there are different prices, right? If you're a member of a loyalty program, for instance, you may end up paying less for an item because you've signed up into a loyalty program. So that does happen to consumers. Okay, I, I, Madam Chair, I just wanted to put the question out there. It's more of a sort of a curiosity than a you know specific pointed question, but okay. unique yeah. to the gas station a business model. Um, okay. It's not over in the other retailers, but. Thank you. We're going next to Senate Bill 255, Senator Bottle, State Personnel Management System, Office of the Public Defender, Placement and Collective Bargaining. And um, you know our rules, uh, uh, sponsor has the time he or she needs to explain the bill. Uh, other uh, speakers will have two minutes uh, each as a max. Uh, and um, we'll get started now with Senator Battle. Thank, thank you, Madam Chair. Good afternoon, Chair Kelly, Vice Chair Feldman, and members of the Finance Committee. Senate Bill 255 is a state personal management system bill on the Office of the Public Defender Placement and Collective Bargaining. You've heard this bill before, we heard it last year. Senate Bill 255 makes changes to the employment status of the attorneys in the Office of the Public Defender from classification of special appointee to the more appropriate professional service under the state personnel management system. They go from being at will to having the same rights and protections that other state employees and professional service have. Senate Bill 255 adds the Office of Public Defenders to the list of state agencies that are covered under collective bargaining. This is enabling legislation. Once passed, the OPD employees will still need to do an election with the State Labor Relations Board to certify a collective bargaining unit to represent them. A minor technical amendment is needed and the drafting process is sentenced was stricken that prohibits the attorneys in the office from engaging in private practice. I have an amendment prepared to remove that prohibition and it's in the committee. Collective bargaining for OPDs is allowed in 19 other states. It's beyond time that our Maryland Office of Public Defender Attorneys employees have the same due process that most other state employees have. The reason the OPTs do not currently have collective bargaining dates back to 1996, when an executive order from, from then Governor Glenn Denning directed that all agencies covered by his direct control would be covered by collective bargaining. And public defenders were not considered to be under his control, they're considered independent. It's time to allow OPDs to have the right to collective bargaining. I thank you for the opportunity to present Senate Bill 255, and I respectfully request a favorable report. Okay, I learned something as to why the situation is as it is. Thank you. Any questions? Okay, we're going then to Denise Gilmore, Ask Me Maryland. Hi, good afternoon, Madam Chair, Mr. Vice Chair, and members of the committee. My name is Denise Gilmore, and I'm a field director with Ask Me Council 3. Uh, we want to thank Senator Beidle for sponsoring Senate Bill 255 and all senators who have signed on uh, as co-sponsors for your support as well. We're also grateful for the support we've received from several community organizations who have submitted written testimony. Uh, SB 255 will enable collective bargaining for roughly 650 state employees who currently work at the Maryland Office of the Public Defender, and it will give them the same merit and bargaining rights uh, that 30,000 other Maryland state employers already have, like state doctors and, and pilots. If SB 255 is enacted into law, uh, employees will still need to hold an election with the State Labor Relations Board before they can begin to bargain. 
Uh, 18 other states actually permit OPD uh, attorneys and employees to collectively bargain. The scales of justice are still balanced in Pennsylvania, New York, Nevada, Iowa, Montana, and, and will remain so here. A full list of these states can be found in the written testimony AFSCME has submitted. Uh, the American Bar Association and National Legal Aid and Defender Association have all also supported uh, collective bargaining and merit-based hiring in public defense. Uh, so we want to reiterate there are no legal or, or constitutional barriers in, in Maryland to extending collective bargaining to the OPD. And collective bargaining agreements do not trump or interfere with the ethical or, or professional obligations uh, licensed employees have. They simply help to ensure due process and transparency and allow employees to negotiate together for better pay and working conditions. But management will always continue to do the hiring and firing, and nothing in this bill prevents them from doing so. Uh, OPD attorneys, paralegals, social workers, and clerical staff are employees with supervisors and managers just like anyone else, and they have legitimate and urgent issues. We're in this historic moment where we're reimagining public safety and justice in our state. It's also important that we support our frontline workers at the OPD. To wrap up, hundreds of OPD employees have signed onto a petition for collective bargaining. SB 255 just gives them a chance for a voice and a choice. You will hear more from Mr. Shamari Taylor and Ms. Cheryl Hughes-Red, two of our members who are both long-term uh, OPD employees. Uh, as Senator Beidel mentioned, one small technical amendment is uh, needed to restore the prohibition of OPD uh, attorneys engaging in private criminal practice that was stricken from the first reader uh, draft and error. Uh, we urge the committee to please provide a favorable report on SB 255 with this amendment. Uh, thank you, and, and I'm happy to take any questions the committee might have. Thank you. Senator Kramer. Yeah, thanks, Madam Chair. Uh, hi there, Ms. Gilmore. Um, I, I'm not sure I quite heard there are 17 or is it 18 states that have already done this very thing? Uh, it's, it's 18 states, Senator. Thank you. 18 states, and can I assume it's functioning just fine in those 18 states? I mean, we're getting close to half the country now, and evidently, if that's the case, it seems to be working. I, I think you were correct in, in assuming that. There have, there have been no large-scale issues with the legal system in either of, in any of those states uh, as an extension of, you know, uh, allowing attorneys to, to collectively bargain for the Office of the Public Defender. So the experience is there, the opportunity to have mined uh, any issues, problems, and there have been none, and uh, it's working out. Good. Okay. Just curious about that. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Uh, we're going next to Shamara, Shamara Taylor, Ask Me Local 423. Hi, good afternoon, uh, Madam Chair, Mr. Vice Chair, and members of the committee. Uh, my name is Shamari Taylor. I'm a member of AFSCME Local 423, and I'm the Attorney Vice President of the Maryland uh, Defenders Union. I've been an assistant public defender for going on nine years. In the past three years, I've worked in the felony division in Baltimore City. Typical day for me involves getting to the office around 7.30, preparing for court, going to court, some days there in court until noon, um, jail calls, answering emails, which usually includes a new case assignment or two, reviewing discovery, speaking to clients, motions, writing, filing, usually finishing at five, but not being completely done. I'm answering calls into the evening, responding to emails, taking care of any matters that might come up. The past two years, I've seen case logs balloon to unprecedented levels. At one point, I was approaching 100 felony cases. That's 100 clients, 100 people, 100 loved ones with families who are depending on me to be their advocate through their most difficult times. We're the same as any other Maryland state worker who has the right to collectively bargain. We are employees, we have supervisors, we have managers. Without a contract, we can be transferred or fired at any time. Our clients have a constitutionally guaranteed right to effective assistance of counsel. The workers at the Public Defender Office are the most dedicated professionals I know. We sacrifice our free time, our weekends, to deliver this guarantee. But common sense tells you that an attorney with nearly 100 cases can't be as effective as an attorney with 60. Over my time at OPD, I've seen countless dedicated professionals leave the work because the conditions are just not sustainable. We need the right to collectively bargain. And so in closing, Madam Chair, Mr. Vice Chair, and members of the committee, 
I'd ask you to join the majority of OPD employees who have already signed a petition in support of Senate Bill 255 for collective bargaining rights so that I and the other dedicated workers can continue to fight for Maryland citizens. Thank you. Thank you. All right, we're going next to Cheryl Red. Ask me local 423. Thank you, Madam Chair and all the members of the committee. My name is Cheryl Hughes Red, and I'm a proud member of Ask Me Local 423. I have worked for the Office of the Public Defender for 17 and a half years as a paralegal. I would like to thank Senator Pam Beidle for her support of this bill. Like many of my fellow court staff, I feel overworked and underpaid. I perform multiple roles for the office in addition to the paralegal job I was hired. If I worked in any other state agency in this classification, I would have collective bargaining. I cannot tell you how many core staff have left our agency because their wages could no longer pay for the basic needs for their family. When core staff leave the agency, those positions often go unfilled. But there is a continuum of hiring of attorneys to be assigned to core staffers that are already overworked and doing the job of two, sometimes three people. Some of the agency's office secretaries often work for eight to 10 attorneys at a time. Having one secretary work for eight to 10 attorneys has an impact on many things. It has an impact on the attorneys, an impact on the secretary, an impact on the quality of work that is being produced, and ultimately the biggest impact, how it affects the representation of our clients. There are too many core staff that are working a second or third job just to cover their monthly expenses. The time that they spend working a second or third job is time that is taken away from their families. Not just time that is taken away, but they are missing precious moments of their children's lives. This is why our agency needs collective bargaining. So parents do not have to choose between helping their child with their homework or being late for the second job that pays their bills. Collective bargaining will give us the opportunity to negotiate salaries and make sure that staff in our agency are making a living wage. I urge you to give a favorable report on Senate Bill 255. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we're going next to Ty Hollinger, Maryland Catholic Labor Network. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Chair Kelly, Vice Chair, and, and members of the Finance Committee. Uh, it is an honor to be here with uh, workers, employees from the public defender's offices across the state of Maryland to support uh, their efforts to secure collective bargaining rights. Uh, our Maryland Catholic Labor Network is a statewide network of uh, leaders in labor, uh, lay members of, of Catholic parishes around, and some clergy and religious around the state of Maryland. And we've submitted written testimony and I just be very brief and just say that this is at the one of the core principles of our Catholic social teaching. All workers have the right to form unions. All workers have the right to collectively bargain for the conditions and, and the remuneration of their work. Uh, this goes back to our American bishops spoke about this in the mid 1990s in their pastoral letter on the economy. Uh, no one may deny the right to organize without also attacking human dignity um, because this, uh, uh, Preventing workers from the right to organize is, uh, we believe, in violation of a fundamental human right, and that um, the right of, of, of workers to be secure for their families to provide the, uh, all the benefits and, and, and needs of a, of, a, of a family, of a working family. In addition, we also see this uh, really integrated with justice in, uh, in the court system, justice for criminal defendants who, who have the right to have a full, honest, vigorous defense of their of their rights in court. And so we just wanna support all the workers of uh, the uh, public defender's office in the state. And we urge your favorable report on Senate Bill 255. We urge this to happen this year and that these workers no longer have to wait to uh, form their unions. Thank you. Thank you. We're going next to Cynthia Knight, Maryland Office of the Public Defender. Good afternoon, Madam Chair Kelly, Vice Chair and members of the committee. My name is Cynthia Knight and I am the Chief Human Resources Officer for the Office of the Public Defender. Thank you for allowing me time to comment on this bill. I would like to highlight the following points from my written testimony. The Office of the Public Defender is a law firm. 
the framers of our agency were sensitive to this distinction and ensured we were not set up as a typical state agency. We were established as an independent agency designed to be free from outside influence to solely focus on advocacy for our clients. The Office of the Public Defender proudly employs 561 attorneys, 209 of whom have had the distinction of being long-term attorneys. Since January 1st, 2020, we have had 56 employees submit for retirement, many with 20 years or more of service. For clarification, special appointments are at-will employees who have all the rights and privileges of regular state employees. They are annually evaluated by the PEP process. They contribute to the pension system for retirement benefits. They are not subject to annual reevaluation to keep their jobs. In the past year, we have successfully worked with DBM to increase the starting salaries for our special appointment attorneys. This bill would unfortunately shift priorities away from our client-centered values and obligations by eliminating recruitment efforts focused on bar contingent offers to recruit the capable attorneys that our clients deserve. Comments about job security are simply not true. Our current disciplinary process is used sparingly and in only the most extreme situations. Over the past three years, we've only had three attorney terminations and three core staff terminations. Even during the great resignation, we have maintained a lower turnover rate than most state agencies. Being a public defender is a difficult job with long hours and unique circumstances. Our clients depend on us to represent them with the best qualified attorneys. And this can only be obtained by us retaining the broad flexibility that the framers of the Office of the Public Defender implemented. For these reasons, the Maryland Office of the Public Defender urges this committee to issue an unfavorable report on Senate Bill 255. Thank you. Let me ask you, if money were not a problem, would you have the same stance on this bill? Yes, I would, Senator. Okay. All right, let's go next to Paul DeWolf, Maryland Public, oh, I uh, see Senator Kramer saying. Senator Kramer. Yes, thank you for that, Madam Chair. So Ms. Knight, I'm gonna see if I can get a little clarification in your comments. Um, the first of which is the framers of whomever it is that created the office took certain actions. Who are those framers and when did that occur? Well, Senator Kramer, I can't go into the exact historical um, background on that, but we have, we have been omitted by the criminal statute, um, state personnel pensions 12102, state personnel pensions 3102, I believe. So there, there are several um, statutes where we've been eliminated and that was done on purpose and for a reason. And it has worked up to, um, up to this point. So I contend why change now? What is the reason we're operating effectively and we're providing superior um, representation for our clients. Well, and I think the testimony we've heard earlier contradicts this notion that it is working well, so why change, which uh, is the reason for my question, if we don't know when these uh, framers that we know have no idea who they were, constructed whatever currently exists in statute that perhaps time would lead one to believe that it could become outdated and that clearly what we're hearing from those who are testifying today, it's not working out. And in fact, if it turns out they are perfectly happy as you represent to this committee, then they have the option not to go down to this path, down this path. This is enabling legislation, is it not? I'm not understanding your question, Senator. In other words, if the employees of this office are perfectly content as you have represented that everything's working well, then 
they can make the choice not to be part of a bargaining unit. That is correct. This legislation is giving them that opportunity should they choose to pursue it. Should they choose to pursue it, but right. I would contend that our mission is to secure justice, um, protect civil rights, and preserve liberty for our clients. And, and I appreciate need- that. And can you tell me how that mission would change if these same workers were granted the ability to be participating in a collective bargaining unit, how does that change that mission that you just described me, ma'am? Well, there are a variety of reasons, Senator. Um, Off the top of my head, our grievance and termination process um, that that is afforded to um, our merit employees would cause a conflict potentially with client attorney privilege in the event that an issue has to go up to OAH. Our attorneys need to be in court daily. Um, We don't have time for them to um, sit in OAH hearings or sit in human resources. Um, We need the flexibility to be able to um, give our clients the coverage. So you're saying, if I understand correctly, that they are so overworked and overburdened that if they should try to seek relief and, and say, hey, wait a minute, this is of a concern to me, they don't have time to raise concerns about their work environment because they're so overworked. No, Senator, that is not what I'm saying. Do you see the contradiction there? You are destroying my comments. That is not what I'm saying. Our employees, we have a very robust, robust HR department, which our attorneys use daily. I can show you the cases that I have. We look into and we investigate every concern. We, are, we want our work environment to be a very comfortable place for all of our employees. But as our attorneys have already, and some of our core staff have already told you, our caseloads are very high and they have an already strenuous workload. We work with them daily to try to get to the um, bottom of any issues and concerns that they have. Our turnover rate supports the fact that we are not abusing our at-will status with our attorneys. We've only had three terminations in three years. Then Ms. Knight, Knight, we're we're getting a little far afield of the question I asked, and we are under tight time constraints. So I understand. You'll you'll have to excuse me. I'm going to have to interrupt you and see if I can start getting answers to my questions. While I appreciate you're telling us that the employees should be very happy, obviously, There is a concern or we would not be having this bill hearing at the moment. So I'm trying to go back to your comments and I believe it said something about opportunities. This by by affording them this, this opportunity to be represented by a collective bargaining unit, it would shift priorities away from recruiting quality employees. Did did I write that down correctly, ma'am? Is that and, yes, and, that's the and, case. That, and that specifically addresses our attorney classification, specifically our ability to hire three L law students and um, our ability to be able to hire people prior to them passing the bar. We currently ma'am, get contingent ma'am, offers. Ma'am, okay, Ms. Knight, we're, once again, I asked you the question. So how would giving them collective bargaining rights impact that? Well, to give them collective bargaining rights, they would have to become our our special appointment attorneys would then have to become merit classification employees. That is what we are staunchly against. Providing our attorneys with merit protections as as they are currently would require us to, everyone would have to apply, everyone who applied for a position would have to have passed minimum qualifications. Currently, right now, we offer contingent offers to our 3L law attorneys before passing the bar. Passing the bar is a minimum qualification to being a public So now attorney. you've gone from, from your comment of it would impact recruiting quality employees to now you're saying, well, here we've got minimal standards 
that we won't be able to meet. And and once again, do you see the contradiction there between? No, I do not. You know, I do see. You know, we we can't what hire quality people, and the and the reason is well because over here they've got to be able to meet minimal standards. And and do you see that you don't see that the the contradictions lost on you? Okay. No. I, all right. Well, for the moment, Madam Chair, thank you. I appreciate the uh, conversation. Thank you, Ms. Knight. Thank you so much. Okay. Uh, next, we're going to hear from the uh, public defender, uh, Paul DeWolf. And uh, Mr. DeWolf, when you finish with whatever you had planned to say, it would help us to understand under what circumstances would you need certain accommodations such as what your colleague was just explaining? If you're talking about maybe three people on uh, staff at any given time who haven't yet passed the bar and they are sort of student workers, uh, but doing um, uh, the job, uh, what about all of the rest? Thank you, Madam Chair. Could I ask your indulgence and ask you if you could hear from Mr. Beach first? Um, he, I think, will, in his written testimony, has answered some of the questions of Senator Kramer. Right. And then I'd like to come back. And then I'd like to come back and just offer a very brief compromise. All right, if we'll I might do it be, in that order. I, thank you so much, Mr. Michael Beach. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, Mr. Vice Chair, Committee Members. Uh, my name is Michael Beach. I am the Director of Strategic Litigation and Law Reform. I have, I've been in this position at OPD since October. Prior to that, I was the district public defender in Southern Maryland for seven and a half years, the deputy down there for two. I've seen um, this job from both the SPMS system, which governs our core staff and our attorneys who are special appointment to answer Senator Kramer's uh, question. I can get into that in a moment. But I joined OPD in 2003 and six years prior to that, I was at a large law firm. I was a judicial law clerk. I did uh, civil uh, public interest practice at Georgetown Law Center. I've seen and lived other legal careers. This is my calling. I love this job. I love my colleagues. Uh, I love our clients. I know from ex experience being a public defender, it's unique. It's unique in the practice of law and in critical ways, it requires flexibility. It has to be different than other jobs in, in hiring and promotion, the disciplinary process. It needs to be flexible. And we have been as an agency and as a result, I've seen in my 18 and a half years, this agency transform into the biggest and best law firm in the state. Sure, we need more attorneys. Um, sure, we can do better. But this bill will undercut so much of the progress we've made and so many of the successes that we've had. I was in leadership for nearly a decade in Southern Maryland. I have seen what happens when you hire a, a third year law student who can't take the bar until the following December. Uh, with a contingent offer. They, we, they've hired them in my district. They're incredible lawyers. They're so good. They're Could so I butt in and ask this? Because I think some of the um, confusion for us just listening is that we're hearing that there are at least three who haven't passed the bar. And I guess that's a structural part of the training that some people get or something. And then there are others. Uh, could you explain to us what your personnel steps are, what the categories of employees are, and what uh, academic um, requirements there are that each category has to meet. And then, then maybe we'll understand more as we're listening. Yeah, I'm gonna try my best, uh, Madam Chair. Um, when, it, I believe it's right in the public defender statute, the minimum qualifications is you have to be admitted to the Maryland bar. And I know from hiring core staff, it's totally different under the state personnel management system, which this bill will put the attorneys in that system. It's a different hiring process. You can't even see certain people. You can't even interview certain people that don't meet minimum qualifications. And we won't even be able to interview as it stands under this bill, people who are third year law students because they're not barred and they don't take the bar usually until the, or they don't get the results and get barred until the following December after graduation. This will kill our entry level hiring. And we have, we've, and it's not just three people. We've hired far more third year law students and other people coming out of. What if, what if, if such a bill is, is being contemplated were considered uh, by this committee and the rest of the General Assembly, if we were to exempt those who are not yet barred from the collective bargaining? 
Well, I don't think that will that will still won't solve all the problems. So for everybody who has passed the bar, and for others who are support staff that aren't required ever to pass the bar, they are the stenographers right. or the the office managers and uh, human resource people and so on. What we we're trying to understand what are the impediments structurally with regard to those staff being uh, in a collective bargaining unit? I, I'm not, I'm not, I'm only talking about attorney hiring, uh, Madam Chair, and I'm talking about it having participated in the hiring of core staff under the state personnel management system. Okay, so I'm just asking you then, if we were to say, if, if it isn't already in the bill, that we would amend out those students who are doing what they are supposed to do, but who are not yet uh, uh, persons having passed the bar. So they'd have to meet that uh, level before they could be considered to join the collective bargaining unit. Well, when, I'm just, we're just trying to understand the sure. structure. I mean, that would, that would help, but it wouldn't solve all the problems that this bill would cause to our hiring. All right, well, then I'm gonna shut up. Would you tell us about the problems? Well, part of the, you know, it's not just hiring, and I, but let me stick to hiring for a moment. Mm -hmm. Instance, if, and I know this for having participated in the core staff hiring process, if there's, there's minimum qualifications or there are qualifications that make you pop up as best qualified, better qualified, and the key is for getting the best talent, and I'm talking about attorneys, you need to be able to identify these dedicated, singularly focused public defenders early and make them offers because the competition for them is fierce. And the problem I see is having from, we have amazing core staff. So I'm not saying anything negative about our core staff. They're incredible, but it is different when you're talking about attorney hiring. And what would happen is, for example, someone would get an advantage in the hiring process if they're a Maryland resident over, let's say a native Marylander who goes to law school out of state or somebody who has prior Maryland government experience. And I've seen this in core staff hiring who may not align with our mission they get a leg up in the hiring process. I've seen it in poor staff hiring. How do, how do they get the leg up in the hiring process? Because they have prior state government uh, employment experience. Well, if they've already shown what they can do, you don't have to hire them if they aren't up to snuff, do you? But they shouldn't get a leg up over somebody who doesn't, who, who is a dedicated wannabe public defender. That's all they want to do in their lives. They, that person who, who worked, let's say, or as, as a probation officer or or Department of Juvenile Services, they shouldn't get an, they, they should get the same shot as everybody else. They should absolutely get a fair shot like everybody else. They shouldn't get an advantage over somebody who is, a, let's say, a native Marylander at an out-of-state law school who is absolutely committed to this. Well, work. I don't think there's anything in this bill that would cause somebody to, for reasons that are demographic, to be ahead of anybody else. Let me say this, and most, and I'm not a, a, an attorney nor a labor expert, but in all of the categories of jobs in Maryland for which there is collective bargaining, there are many different job titles and many people need to meet different criteria, objective and subjective to some degree in order to uh, do the job. Uh, so is there something that you or Mr. DeWolf or somebody could think of uh, to come up with a, a hiring pattern or plan. Maybe you think a particular way of doing this is going to be imposed upon you, which may not necessarily be the, the case. Uh, so you do get to hire. I don't think people in collective bargaining units have the unit determine who gets hired initially. The, the, uh, the office of the department needing the workers do the hiring. So. Uh, sure. What I'm really talking primarily about, though, is the impact of placing attorneys in, this, in the um, state personnel management system as far as hiring. And I can also talk about as far as, as, as discipline from experience, because I, I've, I've and sadly I have to very, very rarely go through the disciplinary process with both attorneys who are special appointment and core staff who are not. Um, so in its. Well, I'm going to shut up. Senator Kramer has it saying it, but it would help us maybe if you were to send us back, Mr. DeWolf, just a chart or some kind of a hierarchy letting us see on paper the structure 
of the Office of the Public Defender and what the criteria are in terms of academics and other things uh, for the, the various categories. And maybe if we're asking dumb questions, we could ask more intelligent questions. Oh, not, not at all. And I'm sure if we can get something like that together, I'm going to have to defer to Mr. DeWolf on that. But what okay. I can say and what I was getting at. The well, I see a question was, for you also, Senator Kramer. I'm just going to, you got a, another question, Senator, or you want to wait and let's we may well, I, Madam Chair, as long as we're having this conversation with Mr. Beach at the moment, I guess my question for you, Mr. Beach, is how much time have you spent trying to learn and understand the state personnel management system and how it actually functions and works? Um, have, you engaged, have you engaged with the folks who actually know how the system works so that you have a clear understanding of that? I... Well, I do not work in our human resources department, so Ms. Knight. Okay, knows. you but just answered the question, no, Mr. Beach. Thank let me, you. Let me, well, I can't answer just answer the question, Mr. Beach. The well, you didn't let me. You didn't not let me familiar me. with it. Well, he, I am yeah. familiar with it in practice, and that's important. I'm familiar with it in practice, and that is important in the practice of hiring and in the practice of the disciplinary process. I'm familiar with the differences between how it works for attorneys who are not in SPMS and core staff who are very familiar. Okay, okay. Well, we did All have right. constructive remarks and I butted in and asked you a question. So finish your constructive remarks so we can hear from Mr. DeWolf. You know, like I said, I have nothing but great things to say about this agency. And I'm not saying we can't get better. And I'm not saying we need a lot more attorneys, um, but this, this is going to really set us back. And I, and I wanna talk about another thing. We've, particularly in my old district, I have seen- But we don't want to talk about your old district. We're talking about the state office of the public defender. So I, I am, but I have borne witness to our office's um, current um, ability to promote and advance the best and brightest. I've seen it in my old job. So I'm a witness to it. Having the flexibility to promote people based on talent and not based on seniority is critical. And I am concerned, we are concerned this bill would set us back on that. We and your title within the office is what? Right now, my title is Director of Strategic Litigation and Law Reform. And that's as of October of last, of 2021. Okay. But I was in leadership for nine and a half years, seven and a half as the District Public Defender for Charles Calvert and St. Mary's County. Okay, thank you. All right, let's go now to Mr. DeWolf. Um, Thank you, Madam Chairman, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, I, I wanna begin by saying I agree and support the statements of, of Ms. Knight, especially with regard to the SPMS system and, and Mr. Beach. Um, but if you're inclined to support this bill, I'd like to offer a compromise. And the compromise is this, that um, this bill, um, Senate Bill 255 include the administrative staff, we call them the core, the core staff. Um, but but uh, for reasons that Mr. Beach got into and reasons that I'm happy to answer uh, questions about, uh, to leave the attorneys in the, current, uh, in the current status. This will preserve our, the importance of our flexibility. It's critical to, to recruitment. It's critical to advancement. Mr. Beach talked about being um, involved in special assignment. We have, we have seven special assignment offices across the state. Um, putting attorneys into the SPMS system would uh, compromise the flexibility there and with transfer. We're committed to our mission. Um, I've been a public defender for 32 years. I love this agency. I, I've heard good things about your work with and, and, we've, plan, but and we've worked together, yeah. Senator Kelly, on the Sentencing Commission as well. Yeah. And, and I yeah. appreciate um, all the support you've given to our agency. But our, our mission is to provide su uh, superior representation to our clients. That's, that, that's our mission. Um, and the bill with respect to the attorneys will compromise our flexibility to continue to serve uh, on this mission. Uh, the Attorney General's Office, you heard from the Attorney General today, and this gets back to what's, what Ms. Knight said about uh, the founding of the agency. We are the largest law firm in the state. Um, 
The Attorney General's office is the second largest. Uh, they are not, their attorneys are not in the SPMS system. And the reason for that is for the flexibility to recruit, to retain, to advance and to, to assign. And as caseloads develop across the state, we want to have that flexibility to move people around and to address the concerns that Mr. Shamari Taylor talked about. So I, I offer that compromise the compromise of the core staff. That the non-attorneys could be in collective bargaining. Attorneys, attorneys would be special appointments as they are now. Right. They, it, would not change, it would not change their status, but it would, it would enormously help us, um, especially, uh, Mr. Beach talked a little bit about recruitment, but our, our recruitment uh, would, would be uh, tremendously affected negatively actually uh, in if they were part of the SPMS system. And Ms. Knight is, is the expert on the S, SPMS okay. system as our one HR. One last question from me and then I see another hand. Uh, are most uh, offices of public defenders in other states um, under collective bargaining to any degree? No, no, so the, the answer is no. I heard Ms. Gilmore say that there are 18 states there are not 18 states that have statewide public defender offices. Um, most of the uh, states that do have some form of collective bargaining or union for attorneys are county-based, not, not state-based. There are only, I think okay. there are only 15 or 16 statewide public defender offices. And I'm frankly not aware of any that have um, unionization, but some, most states, of the 50 states, most of them are county-based systems. So I okay, hope that so that's you. one difference. I hope that then, answers your question. Okay, and in those states that are not county-based, um, are the non-attorneys um, under collective bargaining in any of them? I'm not sure, but again, we're not opposed to non-attorneys being, okay, being involved. So, in so at least we found out one thing. So it is the attorneys. You see yourself as the state's law firm for uh, people who need a public defense, and, and that's our mission. That's our mission. Agency, and uh, it's okay. I, I I see where you're coming from. Did you still have a question, Senator Kramer? All right. But was there anything else you you two wanted to tell us before we move on? Thank you. Thank you for hearing from us. We appreciate. It. Okay. Thank you very much. And. I think that ends the oral testimony uh, that we have. We oh, okay today. Thanks so much. And uh, if we have questions, we'll get back to you to try to be sure we understand uh, your position. And uh, we certainly uh, would invite all of those that uh, are, are here representing. Uh, the affirmative of this bill. If you've got anything you need to, to pass back to us, we, we want to hear it. But I think we understand it, that more than ever, that there is more than one position, that if we were talking about everybody in the office of the public defender uh, being under collective bargaining, you're opposed. Uh, but if we're talking about the non-attorneys, then you are not opposed. That, that's our compromise position. Okay. Uh, Senator. All right. Thank you so very much. Okay. And that will end the testimony on um, Senate Bill 255. Thank you. All right. We're going next to Senate Bill 1, Senator Bidel, State Finance and Procurement Prevailing Wage Stop Work Order. Um, you will have the time you need to explain your bill, and then uh, the uh, oral witnesses will have two minutes each. Thank you, Chair Kelly, Vice Chair Feldman, and members of the Finance Committee. Senate Bill 1 authorizes the Commissioner of Labor and Industry in the Maryland Department of Labor after an investigation to issue a stop work order to a public works contractor or subcontractor that may have violated the state's prevailing wage law. These are only on state contracts. The bill requires the commissioner to conduct an investigation of compliance with prevailing wage requirements 
promptly if the commissioner receives a complaint of a violation or possible violation. The commissioner may impose penalties or civil fines for specific violations. The stop work order is completely discretionary on the part of the, um, of, of the commissioner of labor. The Maryland State Board of Contract Appeals has jurisdiction to hear and decide an appeal arising from a decision to issue a stop work order, and the bill establishes timelines for submitting an appeal to the board. If a stop work order is issued against a subcontractor, the prime contractor on the contract may terminate the contract with the sub without incurring liability from damages resulting from termination. The commissioner shall issue an order releasing the stop work order on showing by the contractor or subcontractor that the employees are being paid at the appropriate prevailing wage. So there's an immediate fix if it's needed. The bill is obviously aimed at the bad actors that are, con that are the contractors receiving prevailing wage contracts. I thank you for the opportunity to present Senate Bill 1, and I respectfully request a favorable report. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Are there any questions of the sponsor? Okay. Uh, we'll go then to Ron Meshiker, Eastern Atlantic States Regional Council of Carpenters. Thank you, yeah. Madam Chairwoman. Uh, I appreciate the time today to be able to uh, speak in favor of Senate Bill 1. You know, I, I have a unique perspective in looking at this legislation. Uh, one, I'm, I'm from New Jersey, uh, where there is stop work order legislation in place, and it's been, been used very sparingly, only in the most egregious uh, cases by the New Jersey Department of Labor. But in addition to that, in my role with the Eastern Atlantic States Regional Council of Carpenters as the Director of Industry and Labor Compliance, you know, prevailing wage fraud is something I see every day. Um, but from my unique perspective, I also served as a longtime board member for Associated Builders and Contractors in the state of New Jersey. And I was the chief operating officer of a large interior construction company, which did business extensively in Maryland. I was with that company for 16 years. So I see it from both the labor side uh, the merit shop side, and also as somebody who ran a construction company. And what this really comes down to is simple. Um, some of the laws that are in place right now in Maryland haven't been enough of a deterrent to stop bad actors from underpaying their employees on prevailing wage projects. Um, a stop work order is exactly the deterrent that is needed to ensure the workers are getting paid properly, especially with jobs that are being funded with public dollars. Um, it, it really comes down to, are we gonna be worried about uh, companies? And uh, I know some of the counter arguments on this are, oh, well, you know, a, a shutdown costs money and things like that. but after an investigation, as was just articulated, if it's found that there are uh, infractions of the Prevailing Wage Act, it's impacting Maryland's workers. What better way to send a message to bad actors to say, yeah, your job's going to be shut down until you're paying uh, workers the proper wages and benefits that they're allowed under Maryland's Prevailing Wage Act. This this legislation gives the commissioner of labor the discretion to make that statement to force bad actors into compliance immediately. And the mere fact that it will be on the, on the books in Maryland will make the bad actors look at the way they're doing business on Maryland's uh, publicly funded construction projects differently. They're gonna have to follow the rules where the commissioner will have the ability to shut them down in an effort to protect the workers and their wages. So I urge you to, to uh, look at this bill as protecting Maryland's workers and uh, view Senate Bill 1 favorably. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Reedy and then Senator Hershey. Thank you, Madam Chair. Question that I would have, um, uh, 
when I, when you, we say it's bad actors and it's a developing problem, how how often do you, would we estimate this is happening in Maryland, where people, where people, I assume this is when contractors are not paying subs, the prevailing wage. How often is this happening? Do we have like an exact number or a rough number? Well, to be honest with you, almost almost every job where you don't have a uh, you know a, a unionized workforce that's protected under collective bargaining rights. And, uh, you know, the, the workers that are most impacted. Wait, wait a minute. I, and I'm sorry to interject that because we, we it's been a long day. I just want to be clear. You're saying almost every time. Well, is how many times is that? Is it documented? Well, if you'd like if you'd like a report, I'm sure we can we can work that up. But every prevailing wage project where I examine certified payroll records or compare certified payroll records to monthly billing records in the state of Maryland, we detect payroll fraud in there, whether it be the misclassification of craft, whether it be ghost employees, or whether it be simple underpayment through our skimming, or just no showing people on certified payroll records. I would say it's basically 100% of the uh, jobs without uh, project labor agreements. And forgive my ignorance, but what recourse does somebody have when you find that? What do you do now? We submit it to the Department of Labor as a uh, referral. And do they, they of the not take, do they just not take action or? I right. don't I don't want to characterize it as that. But, you know, do, do they take the action that's needed to get the workers? And, and many times, as I, as I was getting ready to say a moment ago, the workers most impacted are uh, you know the lower the 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 the, uh, the the trades making the least amount of money, and they're being taken advantage of, and they're being undercut, and many of them are from marginalized communities, uh, and they may not feel they have any recourse, so their employer takes advantage of them. These folks need their money; they need the money they're entitled to, and they should be paid it when payday comes around. They shouldn't have to wait for a complete Department of Labor investigation uh, to go through all of that. A stop work order when we, when we find egregious, uh, you know, uh, cheating on prevailing wage jobs will hopefully solve that problem. You know, the contractors should be correcting the problem. They shouldn't be misclassifying workers at a lower craft rate position. They shouldn't be skimming their hours and you know, showing them working 24 hours a week on a prevailing wage job when they really worked 40. Because my so other question is going to be, yeah, my other question was going to be, and I'll stop after this, Madam Chair, because I have, I have maybe some, I'd love to know more about this issue just in my own education, but I I, uh, I, I would wonder why a sub would keep working if they weren't getting what they were supposed to, but I guess you're, the allegation is that they're not paying, the, the sub's getting the money, but the workers are not, basically, is what, what, what you're you're alleging what you all were saying. Cor correct. Correct. What, what happens is, is that, you know, you get some, the subcontractors are the bad actors and they put people on the job and maybe they don't understand it's supposed to be prevailing wage and they give them, you know, their normal wage rate. Or another example would be uh, the uh, employer, and I'll use carpenters as an example because I'm with the carpenters. His men are doing carpentry work. And uh, normally, privately, they make $20 an hour. Well, they go back to their employee and say, hey, I can get you on this prevailing wage job, but you're going to be paid as a laborer. Um, and the reason you're getting okay. paid as a laborer is, is because, hey, I took the, you know, they make whatever excuse they have to have to make, but they pay them at the lower rate and say, well, I know it's less than you should get as a carpenter, but would you rather make $45 an hour or do you want to work privately on one of my private jobs making your normal 20? So they're putting an employee in a, in, in a position to make that business decision for their family. You know, I'm getting cheated, but I'm still making more than I would make if I was working privately, which in no way, shape or form makes that right. But that is the decision that unscrupulous employers force their employees into making every day on prevailing wage work. And it may I appreciate, not be, I yeah. yeah, I'm not, I'm not cutting you off because I don't want to talk. I just know the chair would like to move it. I would appreciate some real statistics. If we have, I know Senator Biden, we can talk of course, but I mean, just statistics on how often this is happening at like, you know, 
the statistics on it. So thank you very I, much. I can, yeah, I can reach out to you off offline. We can set up a meeting. That would be fine. Okay, thank you. Okay, we're going next to Conte Bedney, the Eastern uh, Atlantic States Regional Council of Carpenters. Good afternoon, Chair Kelly, Vice Chair Fieldman Committee, members and guests. My name is Conte Bedney and I'm a council representative with the Eastern Atlanta States Regional Council of Carpenters. I serve as the DMV area, DC, PG County, Charles County, Montgomery County, and Northern Virginia. I'm here in support of the prevailing wage stop work order bill. I would like to start by sharing my life story and why this bill is so important to people like me. I had a rough childhood growing up. My mom served 10 years in prison and my dad was killed in Lawton Prison in Lawton, Virginia. My great aunt raised me and she did the best she could to keep me out of trouble, but trouble found me. I dropped out of high school in 11th grade, started running the streets and I was arrested at, and did 18 months and I had time to think about my life. When I came home, I went to a pre-apprenticeship program that allowed me to earn a GED and a pre-apprenticeship certificate in construction. I enrolled in the Carpenter's Apprenticeship Program, worked my way up from an apprentice to a journeyman, then to a foreman, and now I'm a council representative. It is important that these programs continue to thrive in low income areas and continue to help people that need second chances mm -hmm. to give their lives from, to help them with their lives from poverty to the middle class. I'm proud to say that I'm a father of six, that I take pride in caring for and being a good provider to them. I'm engaged to be married and I'm a productive citizen, all in which I learned from professional men and women from the Carpenters Union. This bill stops unscrupulous contractors from being bad actors in the construction industry. If contractors aren't breaking the law, they have nothing to worry about. This legislation ensures that workers like me are paid the wages and benefits to which we are entitled and have earned under the law. Thank you for your time. And I ask for a favorable committee report. Thank you very much for your testimony. Okay, who did I go to? All right, Unique, Lunique uh, Esteem uh, from Esteem Enterprises, Inc. <laughs> Uh, yes. Uh, good afternoon, Madam Chair, and to a first certified MBE headquartered in Atlanta, Maryland. As an MBE and a contractor with the Carpenter Union, we hire union carpenters and contractors every over, on every project because of the reliability and quality of service they provide. And then, competitive bidding environment with high stakes projects, it's virtually impossible to compete with other contractors that are other, underpaying their workers and cheap taxpayers by not complying with the law. It's dangerous and simply not the right thing to do. Beyond that, from a pure business standpoint, the stakes are just too high for us to get involved in workplace violations and underpaying our workers. I have a lot invested in our reputation of our company. I started Estimate Enterprise in 1996 and we've built a strong team of reputable, qualified, excellent construction workers and engineers. Currently, we provide construction and construction management support to a variety of federal, state, local county governments and large corporations. Our team includes licensed professionals and a number of skilled tradesmen. We handle projects of all kinds and scopes, whether it's working with companies such as AT&T or locally with Clark Construction. To give you a sense of the scale of projects we handle and the points of it, we were the lead construction management firm on the, on the Fort Belvoir Community Hospital, which is a $1.2 billion state-of-the-art military hospital for active and retired military personnel. We an initiative for the U.S. Navy at Camp Pendleton, and we recently worked in conjunction well, in association, I'm sorry, with Clark Construction on the uh, new 
Capital Region Medical Center in Largo, Maryland, which is a 600,000 square feet state of the art hospital. That's just a, uh, uh, to give you a glimpse of the kind of projects we manage and the importance of us working on those projects. We cannot simply cheat our workers on their wages. That just wouldn't work for some of the companies we work for. And if, we, and if we're competing against other companies that are underpaying their workers, we'll never win the project because our bids will always come in higher. So I want to just give you a brief overview of who we are, some of the things we provide, and the importance of this bill that we're in support of, and we hope to get a favorable response from the Senate today. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, we're going next to Roger Mano. Are you the Roger Mano who's here with us? Yeah. Uh, yes, ma'am, Madam yes. Chair. Nice to see you. How are you doing, Senator? I'm, I'm doing well, thank you. Nice to see all my friends in the Finance Committee. Uh, Madam Chair, if I might, um, uh, Senator uh, uh, Troy Singleton from uh, New Jersey, who is the author of the original New Jersey bill on which this bill is based, had to leave because they're in session right now. And they asked that I read his remarks, if I might. Okay, do so. Thank you, Madam Chair. Senator Kelly, members of the Senate Finance Committee, thank you for allowing me to submit this testimony in support of legislation that will undoubtedly provide labor protections to many working men and women in Maryland. My name is Senator Troy Singleton. I represent the seventh legislative district in New Jersey State Senate. I'm also a member of the Eastern Atlantic States Regional Council of Carpenters, Local 255. So I come to you this afternoon with the perspective of a fellow policymaker and someone who has been firsthand understands what happens when workers are exploited by unscrupulous employers. I'm in strong support of Senate Bill 1, House Bill 145. I wanna thank the sponsors of this proposal for their advocacy and leadership on this issue. As the prime sponsor of similar legislation, which became law in New Jersey in July, 2019, I'm glad to see Maryland move in the same direction which will ensure employees on prevailing wage projects are paid accordingly and treated fairly. Senate Bill 1, House Bill 145 will provide tools for the Commissioner of Labor and Industry in Maryland to protect workers and hold bad employers accountable. In New Jersey, we've seen instances where employers do not keep payroll records, misclassify workers as independent contractors, and do not provide workers' compensation insurance to employees who qualify. These practices may stop, and the best, most effective way to give the commissioner the ability to issue stop work orders with their employer is, is through a violation in this legislation. Employee misclassification is a problem because when workers are misclassified as independent contractors, it not only diminishes their access to labor protections, but it also has real consequences on the state's economy and tax revenues. We acted in New Jersey to address this important issue after a 2018 New Jersey Department of Labor audit found that more than 12,300 cases of workers were being misclassified, which results in more than $460 million in underreported wages and $14 million in lost state unemployment and temporary disability contributions. This audit, which covered just 1% of businesses, means that this is much more widespread of a problem that not only cheats workers out of their entitled wages, but also cheats taxpayers and government out of dollars that would fund workers' comp and unemployment benefits. In the construction industry, this practice is even more egregious, harming both workers and law-abiding employers alike. Before all else, we must protect the rights of men and women who are working hard each day to earn a decent and fair living. We cannot build a stronger and fairer economy without strong workplace protections that ensure fairness for employees. This proposal sets a high standard for how we should treat our workers. And I hope that this body will expeditiously move to protect its workers. I thank the committee for this opportunity to address you for, this, for your consideration of this important legislation. Thank you, Senator Troy, Middleton, uh, Tr Troy Singleton, excuse me. Thank and you. I'd like to personally thank uh, Senator Pam Vidal for her leadership, members of the committee. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I see two hands raised, uh, Senator Benson and then Senator Hershey. You've got to unmute, Senator. Unmute. We can't hear you. You must unmute. Yes. Thank you very much. Um, I want to make a statement and then ask a question. I want to thank 
uh, Kute Bende. I, I want, want him to know that I am immensely proud of him. You know, he pulled himself up by the bootstraps. But you also need to understand, ladies and gentlemen, had it not been for the, uh, the apprenticeship program of the union, uh, he would not have had a fair chance in life to take care of his children and not be a burden on taxpayers. My question uh, is this, um, as we look at this whole issue of prevailing wage, I, I, I know that um, we have been spending a whole lot of time talking about it. Could someone please elaborate on what happens if we don't have prevailing wages? If we do not pass this bill, if we do not ensure that people like Kute Benet have a fair chance to getting a decent wage to be treated fairly through uh, prevailing wages. What would happen? Do you all have any idea? The, S S Senator, probably the jails would be full, the, the uh, unemployment lines would be full, people are uh, homeless. Uh, the, uh, and so on, uh, you, you really do raise the specter of what there would be without people having a decent uh, ability to work and to feed their families. Thank you very much. That's, I, I just want to bring that out. Okay. All right, and now we go to Senator Hershey. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Um, since Roger spoke last, can I wonder if I could just ask him a, a couple questions with just trying to understand how this bill actually gets implemented. Um, the part that was mentioned uh, in the Senator Vital's testimony was that, that a commissioner may issue a stop work order. So obviously an investigation is going to take place, a, a complaint will occur, investigation will take place. During that investigation, isn't the commissioner working or, or trying to gather information from the contractor and the subcontractor during that investigation yes so if if they're working with that and they find out that there was you know some type of violation why then would a stop work order be necessary so um i wish um and i apologize senator singleton had to leave before but he could explain how this works operationally in the state of new jersey but i will just say it is a rare occurrence when a commissioner actually executes the sort of last resort tool to shut down a work site because of a wage violation. There is no other authority, not DEA, not NSA, not you know ICE, that can shut down a work site for a prevailing wage violation. Uh, the, only, um, the only body that has the authority to do that um, under this bill is, is the Commissioner of Labor and Industry. Uh, shut, work sites can be shut down for all kinds of things, you know, uh, crime scenes, drug dealings, all kinds of terrible things by other agencies. But the only person that has the authority under Maryland law or any law to enforce a wage violation, a prevailing wage violation, is the Commissioner of Labor and Industry. So this legislation is a tool, um, a discretionary tool. I will tell you, Senator, as you can imagine, there are um, proponents of the legislation who believe that this bill does not go far enough. This bill is completely discretionary on the part of the commissioner. Some proponents, and maybe this will be brought up in the conversation about amendments, would like to see the word may stricken and replaced with the word shall, that stop work orders would be mandatory. We think that this bill is eminently reasonable, it's fair, and it's a last resort tool for a commissioner to be able to deal with an egregious situation on a work site. Uh, Senator, we do have several more people. Yep, I, 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 just yeah. a couple more, Madam Chair. Oh, I was going to say there are some others listed who I'm like Champ McCullough, who probably can't answer what you're asking. Okay, well, let me just, I, I just want to clarify because the point that the point <laughs> that I guess some people think it can go further, um, and maybe Champ is better to, to answer, Roger, but I'll give you an opportunity. But do you want to explain what a stop order does to a let's say $30 million school construction project as far as um, what happens to all the employees that thought they had to do right. and next day they find out they have nothing to do. Um, Chair, uh, can I 
Can I answer this? Do you mind? Sure. Okay, thank you. All um, right, Adam Sponsor. Thank you. Senator, realize that the, the bill says that the contractor has the right to correct. So if it turns out that he's not paying the correct wage or the classifications aren't correct, he has the right to correct that before a stop work order. And, and if, if it's a subcontractor, he can terminate that subcontractor and bring someone else on the job. So there's all kinds of alternatives before we finally get to the stop work order. And yes, it would be terrible if an entire project is shut down, particularly if it's the sub that's causing the problem. That's why the contractor has the right to correct. Well, that's what I'm saying, uh, Senator. I just, I'm just i trying to find out when this would actually occur. What would have to happen for this stop work order to be issued if, one, it does, it, the investigation happens prior, two, there's an ability for the subcontractor or the contractor to cure the problem. Why, why even have this out there that, I mean, because nobody wants to see the wage theft as you're talking about, but why even have to have this out there and I guess my question is, when is it used if, if all of these provisions are already in place? When, it, when the issue is not cured, when the wage isn't corrected, when the subcontractor isn't doing what they're supposed to be doing, they're given the opportunity. And if they don't, then this is the hammer. So a subcontractor just says, no, nope, I ain't going to do it. I'm not going to pay what I'm supposed to. I don't care if you shut down the project because actually you're going to terminate my contract anyways and I'm gone. Well, it happens, if, I guess. Go ahead, yeah. Roger. If, okay. If, if, okay. If I may. Thank you very much. Thank you, Madam Chair. We've got additional um, um, witnesses who know the industry. Let's see if we can hear from some of those and then if that answers your question. So let's see. Uh, right. Did we hear from Sergio? Sergio. Right. Sergio Batista is the next person listed. Good afternoon. Thank you, um, Madam Chair, uh, Kelly, Vice President, um, Chair Field, and honorable members of the Senate Finance Committee. Uh, my name is Sergio Bautista. I'm a council representative for the Eastern Atlantic's Regional Council of Carpenters. And uh, the reason I'm here today is to testify in favor of the Senate Bill Number One. And before I start, I would like to say, um, uh, before I became a uh, representative, I worked for uh, several number of uh, what we call labor brokers. This uh, particular uh, individuals who have a crew of uh, people on prevailing wage uh, jobs, and I include myself on those when I used to work for them. Uh, in this case, is, uh, I would not have even uh, paid over time or every check I would have uh, would be without no tax deductions. Uh, so I worked for these people for quite a few years. And um, I remember even the first time when I asked one of them uh, about the, the union because on one of these job sites, uh, there was a picket line. So I asked uh, the person that was in charge of us uh, what was going on or what was the, the people doing out there? So the person or the labor broker told me and uh, never talk to them because they're, these people are not good for you. So I did. I, I didn't ask any more questions. But, but then um, after a few years, I was blessed uh, when one of the organizers for the carpenters uh, in Baltimore came up to me in a job site I was working on. He educated me about the, the activities of these uh, labor brokers that they do not only on prevailing wage, uh, prevailing wage uh, jobs, but any other job actually. Uh, and I was blessed to, to get educated about, you know, uh, paying taxes, uh, getting uh, what I should get in this prevailing wage jobs. And, uh, he also informed me about the benefits of being a member of the Carpenters Local. So uh, after a few weeks, I, I joined the local uh, because I thought this was a good opportunity for me as a carpenter in, in this trade. So 
I joined the local and after five years, I got the opportunity to become a representative, a representative for this council. Now I have the opportunity, uh, or I'm on the other side. Now I'm uh, educating other workers and my trade that they have rights uh, when they work in these prevailing wage uh, projects. Uh, they're entitled of the, 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 the pay they should get for each week uh, pays worth of work. Uh, so um, this is something that I've been able to accomplish because the decision I took to join the Carpenters Local, and I, I can say I don't regret that decision for nothing because I think uh, being a, a member of this local have been giving me the opportunity to provide for my family and also looking out for, for a, um, a retirement on my own. I hate age. to butt in, but you're going over your time, but you're Sorry. giving us a good picture of what you've been through and okay. how the system works. Yes, but okay. please, uh, I, will, I will ask the committee to go in favor of report for this legislation. Thank you very much. Thank you. We're going next to Carl Niemeyer. Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for the uh, very long session that, uh, <laughs> to get to this one. So uh, Chair Kelly, Vice Chair Feldman, and honorable members. Uh, my name is Carl Niemeyer. I'm the president and founder of Burma Mechanical and Construction Solutions in Savannah Park, Maryland. We are one of the subcontractors that would be feeling if something happened on a site. Um, I'd like to say hi to everyone I know on here from my unions and Champ and uh, Senator Mano. So we have, uh, my company's got 75 employees, carpenters, steam fitters, plumbers, finishers, uh, laborers, all union. And we are used to paying a fair wage. We get hurt by pork by competition. And we don't usually bid state work because there's not a lot of impetus for me to go out and bid a job when I know I'm gonna get undercut by somebody who's employing independent contractors and taking part in wage theft. You know, we hold a very high standard. We know we can compete in places where there is very well held Davis-Bacon wage and wage certifications because there is a level playing field. So you know, I'm not gonna go on and on about my company. What I wanted to bring to your attention was I used to be a construction manager when I was active duty Navy. At the Naval Academy in Jacksonville, Florida, and there was no slip. There was no room for wage theft to happen. Certified payrolls were monitored weekly. We did wage interviews out in the field of the workers. People could not get away with what this bill is trying to prevent. Quite frankly, when I started a business, when I left the Navy and started employing workers and found out that this wasn't just the normal course of events, because this was the course of my daily events, it was, it was kind of appalling that we would let people get away with this and get away with it so prolifically. So it's, to me, this is critical and a critical and very long time coming bill to pass through to protect workers and contractors so that we can have a better tax base. We can have a better set of projects. The state's better protected. And, and in the end, like I said at the beginning of it, the worker is better protected gets their fair wage, gets a just wage for a full day's worth of work. You know, I'm not worried about a stop work order. I'm not the guy who is going to cause a problem because I'm paying an, an equitable wage. If somebody said, hey, Carl, you know, you're, you've got a guy that's complaining he's not getting paid. What's the problem? I've got a minute to fix. I've got to get in because you're going over time. Over Sorry about that, Chair Kelly. I appreciate the opportunity. Giving very arresting yeah, testimony. That's very helpful. Okay, Senator Kramer. Uh, yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. And I'm not sure who might be best suited to answer this question. Perhaps Senator Mano might uh, be familiar with it. But I guess my question is, is it not possible for the commissioner to issue a targeted stop work order uh, that applies specifically to a particular contractor so that it does not shut down an entire job? Is that, is that an option? 
Let, well, I tell you what, we've got Sean Malone and Champ McCullough. Let's ask both of them if- in I, I'm not sure that's a question that's best suited for them, but- Okay, who, who did you want to um, I, Is Senator Manos familiar with the bill? Uh, Mr. Mayor, thank you. Uh, thank you for that question. Okay. Um, and the answer is absolutely yes. And I can, if if I may, defer to Ron uh, um, Mesker, um, who spoke before. Uh, he has um, a great deal of expertise in this area. Okay. Uh, thank you, Roger. I, I'm I'm going to apologize for not having my camera on, but I had a uh, I uh, had to begin driving because I've got a wife who's guy has a birthday today. So I'm heading home. So if you uh, forgive the lack of a camera, so you're not looking at me driving. Um, yeah, the answer is in New Jersey, a targeted stop work order is far more common than a full job site shut shutdown. It's only occurred three times since the bill was passed where an entire job site was shut down. Uh, the, the targeted stop work orders are 10 to one where they go in and, you know, if there's 40 contractors on a job and they find three are out of line, then they, they shut down those three. And the general contractor then has a business decision to make if they're going to replace that sub on the job, which of course this bill allows, okay? And it can lift uh, a stop work order anyway. Uh, but the targeted stop work order is, a, is is a, uh, is a is a tool that the New Jersey Department of Labor has used. They've used it effectively. And let me tell you, it sends a message to everyone on the job when they see some red stickers on the job and they see some subs missing that, hey, uh, you know, this is serious. We have to play by the rules and we have to pay the workers the wages and benefits that are mandated under the prevailing wage laws. So, yeah. Uh, targeted stop work orders are, are are used and they're appropriate. Thank you. And Senator Hershey has his hand raised. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. And Ron, I'll, I'll just ask you the same question because I mean, a, a question too. I'm trying to find out where where in the process that there is this right to correct or right to cure. When, when and, and maybe that's, that's what you're talking about, if a targeted stop order. So again, you're saying somebody did not take that avenue to, to cure this prior to that occurring? Yeah, normally the, the, the cure uh, on, a, on, a, on a prevailing wage job where certified payrolls are turned in, uh, you know, egregious violations are sometimes recognized. You know, you get a contractor on there that simply doesn't do their paperwork or they fill out their paperwork and they're showing that they're underpaying the wage no, the New Jersey Department of Labor doesn't give them an opportunity to correct before a stop work order goes into effect because they have a complaint, they have victims, and they have paperwork showing that it's occurred. Um, you know, it's when the contractors come in and, and there's going to be, or when the Department of Labor comes in and they audit all of these subcontractors and they get all of that paperwork, you know, at that point, you know, as the previous speaker from the from the mechanical company mentioned, you you know, when I was in the business, I would do a self audit. You know, audits were common from the Department of Labor, and when they would audit a project, you can guarantee I had all that paperwork out in front of me to make sure that I didn't make a mistake. And in, on the very rare occasion where there may be a mistake, you know, we would make sure we rectified it as soon as possible which you're allowed to do, and then notify the Department of Labor, hey, we made a self-correction, we identified a problem, and just be transparent. You know, okay. typically stop work orders are, 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 ha are let happening. Me, let you're... me butt in, because uh, he has spoken and answered questions and have left. We have two additional speakers who are Marylanders and who have expertise in this. If we could get to them, and they also will be testifying with amendments and we may learn something from the amendments. If So let's hear from Sean Malone and then from Champ McCullough and then we'll come back if there's still questions. So if we can go to Sean Malone. Yes, ma'am. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I, on behalf of the Associated Builders and Contractors, my name is Sean Malone of Harris Jones and Malone. 
We uh, thank the sponsor for putting in this bill and in particular meeting with our organization um, to discuss the bill. We are in support of this bill and we think that this is a tool that uh, the Labor Commission should have. Um, rarely in Annapolis is a bill put in the first time in perfect form. Rarely does it always meet the true intent of the bill. Um, this bill, let's be clear, there is nothing in here formally that gives a, the, the um, accused the opportunity to cure before a stop work order. In fact, what this bill does do is, based on an investigation um, of the Labor Commissioner, it enables the commissioner to issue a stop work order, and it enables a general contractor the ability to fire a subcontractor um, without that subcontractor having due process. And the way the prevailing wage law has worked in Maryland, and it's been in place for decades, is that once the investigation is done, there is a hearing. And if there is a, a, a problem, it's resolved. If the contractor um, con continues to contest or doesn't comply with the order, they are subjected to significant penalties to include debarment. Um, so there are penalties in place. But what we have done is we have put forth an amendment that would, would enable the, once an investigation is done, a, a show cause hearing to be put in place in very short order so the contractor could be heard on the issue um, before a final order of the agency is issued and they're forced to take an appeal to an entity, the Board of Contract Appeals, that currently has no role in this process. It's inserted in this bill. Um, if we, we've given written testimony. You can follow the flow charts that we put in place. All we're asking for is that due process um, take place where the, the contractor is heard and given the opportunity to present um, evidence um, before a stop work order is put in place to stop a state job um, from moving forward or portions of that job from moving um, forward. Um, so we put forth these amendments. We're, we're in favor of the commissioner having this as a tool, but as Mr. Mano, I mean, as Senator Mano was testified to, this should be a last uh, of last resort. As Senator Biden um, testified to or talked about, they should have the opportunity to cure and to be heard. That's all we're looking for is due process before they are um, subjected to termination under this bill without due pro okay. process. Okay. And then and in their so, position of appealing to so the that order intermediate appeals. step is is the amendment that you are offering. Yeah, yes, ma'am. That's what we've offered is that there would be a show cause hearing in very short order um, between 24 and 72 hours, where they would where the contractor would be brought in, presented with the, the evidence and given an opportunity to respond. If at that point the commissioner determines the stop work order is appropriate or there is no cure that can be had, then the stop work order is appropriate. Um, if okay. not, um, um, if, if there's a cure, the commission is wrong, okay. the state project doesn't get shut down. And remember, when a work order is put in place, workers stop getting paid. And that's not the purpose. Okay. We're in support of the bill, but we're in support of keeping due process in, in, in the legislation that's been in effect in Maryland let's, for a long time. Let's hear from Champ McCullough, then we'll come back for the sure. questions from those of you who have a great interest and, and you, you obviously do. Champ Thank McCullough. You. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Chairman McCulloch, on behalf of the Maryland Associated General Contractors here, as Sean is, to suggest the bill could be made a little better with a couple of amendments. Uh, th there's no argument in the industry that bad actors are a problem, and every contractor, every good contractor, has a vested interest in seeing them uh, removed from the industry or brought into line. However, this bill, as it's currently drafted, it gives the commissioner the ability to issue a stop work order uh, without any parameters around it. But many times there are disputes about what is the correct prevailing wage. There are also innocent mistakes. And it would be inappropriate for a commissioner to have the ability to levy a stop work order in those cases. I think everyone agrees that it's the bad actors. It's those who knowingly and deliberately refuse to pay the prevailing wage. That are, the, that are and appropriately are the targets of a stop work order. Uh, we have an amendment that would focus the bill on that. It's entirely consistent with uh, Mr. Malone's amendment, so there's not an issue there. But there is one further point. We do need to be precise in the targeting of stop work orders. They are drastic. They affect innocent contractors and innocent employees who have nothing to do with a particular subcontractor's violations. And so the language that we suggest with a second amendment makes it clear 
that the stop work order is issued against an offending contractor or an offending subcontractor rather than against the site in its entirety. It's possible that you might have a, a large project where there's more than one subcontractor who deserves to have his or her work stopped. But it should be narrowed to the, the offending contractor and not the entire site. We'd be happy to answer any questions. Okay. Uh, Madam, Madam Sponsor, um, would you want a little work group uh, with people of your choice among those who have expertise and who've testified today to work with you to decide uh, if either of these amendments works for you uh, and would work for Maryland and anything else that might need to be done to make sure before the committee votes. Um, Madam Chair, I'm always happy to work with people. I have met, I have met with um, Mr. McCullough and I'll be happy to meet again and um, bring some other people along. We'll get that arranged. Thank you. Okay, thank you. You can let us know when you're ready for us to put it on a voting list. Thank you. Right, Senator Augustine. Thank you, Madam Chair. I just wanna ask the, 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 the champ um, and um, Sean, wouldn't the commissioner in the course of the investigation have gone through and given the opportunity, have the opportunity to do some of the things that you're talking about before it got to the point where they had to issue this stop work order? Why wouldn't it happen in the investigation? So why would we need to have these additional, amend, uh, additional amendments? Uh, uh, Senator, uh, I, I think the, the practical aspect of this uh, is reflected in the fiscal note. Uh, the commissioner does intervene in situations where there uh, is a failure to pay the correct prevailing wage and brings the contractor into compliance. The stop work order is really something that needs to be reserved for the, the grossly offending subcontractor who may drag his feet in terms of coming into compliance, uh, even if the commissioner is giving that subcontractor a chance to. Just to follow up to that, isn't it the format of this legislation that does provide that flexibility to the commissioner? I mean, I think that's the whole point of the this very reasonable piece of legislation. Wouldn't uh, you agree? It, it, it Senator, does. Senator, I'm sorry. Senator, unlike the Connecticut, I'm sorry, Chair. Unlike the Connecticut legislation, where it spells out what takes place in an investigation, where there are witnesses put under oath, where there are depositions, where there's evidence put forth, where charges are put forth, it covers. And that is much broader. Maryland doesn't do that. Maryland has a a, a broader term and investigation. While they may come in and ask for records, they may not um, do. A, they may not give a full discussion. And as you're certainly aware, government entities make mistakes during investigations. That's why we provide due process. Let me be clear: no union would ever support firing an individual based on an investigation without due process. And that's what this bill does. We are firing a company, a Maryland company potentially with Maryland workers without giving them due process. An investigation is different from providing a, a, a hearing. And all we're asking for is a, a, a show cause hearing to show why a stop, cause, stop work order shouldn't be in place. We're fine with the tool. We just don't think it should be wielded without due process. And an investigation is only part of due process. As you know, it's not complete due process. Madam Chair, I'm happy to participate in working on this as well. Okay, so Senator Augustine is interested. Uh, Senator Hershey, are you interested? Okay, we got those two, maybe one more member. Uh, Madam uh, Sponsor, you got one more person that you would like to... Well, you, you put together your work group. At least you know these two members of our committee. I want to work with you on it. And when you guys tell us you're ready, we'll vote for right. Thank you. Thank you. All right, that ends the testimony on that bill. We're going next to Senate Bill 259, Senator Fellman. Yes, uh, Madam Chair. Yes, okay. thank you. Uh, this actually, this prior bill we just got done with is the perfect, perfect segue for this bill. Senate Bill uh, 259. Just a reminder on this issue of prevailing wage, just last session, uh, we did pass a bill out of this committee, Senate Bill 35, which did expand uh, what contracts would be subject to prevailing wage. And um, if you remember during that discussion last session, we made a lot of points similar to what 
Senator Benson just was uh, making in the prior bill about some of the advantages, uh, not the least of which is when you expand prevailing wage, you increase uh, the universe of apprenticeships, you uh, tend to shift away uh, the healthcare coverage and other costs that can be borne by taxpayers. And, you know, there is an injection of, of uh, economic stimulus uh, into local economies, which results in some additional tax revenue for our state in the form of income tax and other things. And so that we did have that conversation last year. That was a big bill. That was a much broader bill. This is a much narrower bill. And I, you know, I obviously was interested to see what the fiscal note might say as to any kind of fiscal note impact. And I was surprised that the fiscal note for the entire state of Maryland of this bill, I would say targeted bill, is only at half a million dollars for the entire state of Maryland uh, next year. And I'm just looking at the fiscal note right here. Um, and so again, Senate Bill 259 is narrower. I am happy that a majority of the Finance Committee have signed on as co-sponsors. And what it does is it expands uh, the prevailing wage to state-funded mechanical service contracts, which are contracts to service construction or related systems. We're talking about HVAC, electrical, plumbing, refrigeration, and elevators, and aligns uh, with how those services already handled when part of a construction project. It aligns uh, things with how these contracts are handled under federal law. It aligns um, it, things with legislation that is now moving in several of our counties here in Maryland and it provides some clarification in an area of the code that right now is quite confusing. So currently, Maryland um, is only applying prevailing wages to construction work including the installation of those construction related systems such as HVAC, refrigeration, elevators, et cetera, et cetera. But as soon as those systems are installed, any subsequent service work on those same subs, uh, systems are not subject to prevailing wages, notwithstanding the fact that the service work is often done by the same workers who also did the construction related service work and carry the exact same certifications and levels of technical training so aligning all of that uh, together is one of the goals of the legislation. Secondly, under federal law, under the McNamara O'Hara Service Contract Act, um, it sets a threshold for prevailing wage at $2,500 uh, for these kinds of contracts. By the way, these are contracts that are very small dollar. Unlike the projects we were talking about last year, the $250,000 threshold, big construction projects. Here we're talking three to $5,000 uh, contracts based on a, a recent survey uh, conducted by the Mechanical Contract Tr Contractors Association Metro Washington. So these contracts are very uh, are, are much much smaller uh, than those contracts that were primarily dealt with last year. So aligning the dollar thresholds with federal law is another goal, and also similar legislation just like this one. It's already pending in Anne Arundel, Prince George's, Baltimore uh, County, Charles County, Montgomery. So aligning state law with what's happening at the local level is another goal. I will say the only testimony that you'll see in the packet in opposition comes from one, uh, one organization, MAKO, I, I believe at least signed up. Uh, I think MML may have some concerns, but MAKO only uh, testimony unfavorable. Um, at the same time, we have testimony favorable from Baltimore County, uh, County Executive Johnny Oshevsky, and as I mentioned, Montgomery and all these other counties are actually passing laws just like this. So there's a little bit of a, of a disconnect. All the other testimony in the packet uh, is favorable. And then finally, beyond the idea of aligning Maryland law with federal and local law, is, um, is there's some confusion in the current code uh, as to whether service contracts are already subject to prevailing wage. And it's rooted in part of the code relating to living wages. Another part of the code deals with prevailing wages. And so there's some confusion as to what applies, what doesn't apply. I got an attorney general's opinion that says Department of Labor is actually applying it incorrectly. So that's all background. Specifically, what does the bill do, Three, uh, this particular bill 259? So number one, it clarifies that mechanical system service contracts are wholly within uh, the scope of prevailing wages. Number two, we're not talking about all kinds of service contracts. I just wanna make it clear, we've narrowly defined it. We're only talking about mechanical systems service contracts, such as HVAC, refrigeration, 
plumbing, electrical, elevators. And the reason we're doing that is we want to tie it by only including mechanical service contracts because they're more closely tied to construction, to the construction that actually enabled those systems. So it's very tailored, narrow. It ties the mechanical service a contract prevailing wage threshold to that to federal law, which is currently the threshold is twenty five hundred dollars. Um, and it also, as I said earlier, it aligns um, a state law with local legislation that's moving currently in Anne Arundel, Baltimore uh, County, Prince George's, Montgomery, Charles and others. So that's basically what the bill does. Um, and for all the foregoing reasons, Madam Chair, I'd ask for a favor on Senate Bill uh, 259. Thank you. All right, we're going next to Theresia Small, UA Plumbers and Gas Fitters Local 5. Madam Chair, I appreciate it. Uh, you can go with just T. That's been butchered all my life. T Smalls is just fine. Okay. <laughs> all right. um, I, I, I appreciate the opportunity, Madam Chair, Vice Chair. Um, I think Vice Chair had my notes, so I'm gonna tear up my speech and I'm just gonna say I'm here in support of uh, this being a favorable, uh, in, in favorable consideration. Um, I'm the business manager, financial secretary for Plumbers and Gas for this local number five. We've been around for over a hundred years. And we've been, we started up in 1890 uh, doing plumbing and gas fitting work in the uh, DC metropolitan area. And, uh, and this bill right here, like uh, Vice Chair said, this is is mechanically catered. This is this is catered toward the mechanical service industry. Um, the other part about this 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 particular bill, it levels up the playing field even more on the prevailing wage piece, and it does allow uh, me as a business manager and other business managers and other folks that are doing this mechanical work another tool to uh, provide to, to to individuals that are uh, doing service work to maintain the integrity of the work that was already done. Just like uh, Vice Chair said earlier, the work is being done under prevailing wage already. It only makes sense to continue the prevailing wage portion of it when you're servicing the work that was just put in under uh, prevailing wage. So it only makes sense. So um, not to rehash what he said already, I, I'm asking for a favorable consideration of this. Um, this, would be a, this would be a great tool to continue to level the playing field uh, so I ask for favorable consideration and I appreciate your time today. Thank you. I see Senator Hirsch's hand. Do you have a question of this witness? Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, T. Yes, sir. Uh, just a quick question. Uh, the sponsor mentioned that these were very small contracts. Yeah. Um, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, these contracts, service contracts can range. Uh, honestly, service contracts can be as small as $500, honestly. But I mean, with this right here, lowering it down, it, it just it just levels everything up to where the pay scale stays the same, even on the small, even on the small, uh, on the small service work as well. So, so is it service work or service contracts? You know, well, service, service, service work, can, service work does end up being service contracts as well. OK, so right. if, you, if you if you have a building that was just turned over and you want to open up a maintenance or service contract, if you will. You know, it could be as low as twenty five hundred dollars. It could be as high as two hundred fifty thousand, depending on the terms that you set up that contract. That, that's that's what I thought. I, I thought that that I mean, get, again, service work maybe in the two thousand to thirty five hundred dollars. But if you get a a service contract for you know, again, we're talking about government buildings types of things that they generally are a little bit more complex. Johnson Control issues and and all of those things would would probably be much higher contract costs than just the twenty five hundred to three thousand dollars. Yeah, say for example, the Social Security building down the street for me, they may have five or six toilets in there that where they want. Um, they've got hard water that that damages the flappers on a regular basis in that building. That's not going to be a huge service contract, okay? That's going to be a service contract that's very small. That's going to take a guy probably an hour on a quarterly basis. So that contract right. would be a very small contract, just to give you an idea how small you know, and how, and how it can uh, affect on smaller projects. Is that what they generally do? Would they split, you know, uh, contracts up into multiple, very specific line item type uh, projects, or do they just, you know, maybe hold a, a larger uh, service contract that, that, that has, that entails a lot more items? I think ideally most entities would love to have a service contract that would line up everything. But right. each building in each area has a different 
problem or a different issue. So some things may or may not need to be in a service contract. So service contracts can be tailored specifically to that particular entity, to that particular building. Um, for example, it may be a waste management treatment facility. It may be an office building. It could very well be a maintenance facility. You know, every, every building has a different setup. So service contracts um, are catered and they're, they're pretty custom, just to be quite honest with you, Mr. Hershey. Um, so given this ability to make this thing $2,500 also gives another custom tool in this, in this kit to uh, support some of the work that we're getting done in the area to uh, on the prevailing wage projects and things like that. Does that answer your question, sir? Yes, T, I appreciate it. Thank you, Madam Chair. Okay, thank you. All right, we're going next to, let's see, to uh, Stephanie Sweet, Bethel Electrical Construction Company of Maryland. Oh, uh, Madam Chair. My name is Stephanie Sweet, and I am the owner of Bethel Electrical Construction Company of Maryland. We are an MBE certified and a service disabled, better known small business, and I'm here today to support this bill. Over the years, Bethel has garnished a solid reputation for providing a wide range of superior cost-effective electrical services, including some successful procurement opportunities at Bowie State University, uh, the Atman Glacier Building in Annapolis, the State Highway Administration to include Dayton, Laurel, and Silver Spring, in addition to the Maryland Department of Labor, Licensing, and Regulation, just to name a few. Our success is attributed to a sincere commitment to safety, quality work, and customer satisfaction. These qualities have helped Buff Electrical become a trusted electrician of choice throughout the Mid-Atlantic region for the better half of 15 years. So Bethel Electrical Construction, we are signatory with both IBEW Local 26 and 24. So we hire union workers because we need the quality, safety, and on-time scheduling of the work done by these men and women of the um, unions. It's simply good business for us. In addition to that, we um, do a considerable amount of government and private sector service work as well. We have a current partnership with Genome Services that provides ongoing leadership and mentoring support through the Mentor Protege Program up under the Small Business Administration. This legislation is critical to our future growth and success because it closes a loophole in Maryland regarding the different wages between construction and service work. By expanding prevailing wages to service workers, MBEs like the Bethel Electrical Construction Company can better compete on a level playing field among contractors that pay lower wages with mental benefits, if any at all. In many cases, they cheat their workers through wage theft and misclassification, and we've heard that over and over again throughout these hearings. In addition, by ensuring that prevailing wages are paid on service work, this legislation enables the Maryland Department of Labor's full enforcement authority to ensure that the critical state taxpayer dollars are being spent as the law requires. So this bill, will go a long way towards empowering small MBEs like Bethel Electrical Construction. And it's for these reasons I say to you all that I ask and I'm in support of this legislation. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. All right. Uh, we're going next to, to Jason Williams, Local 602 Steam Fitters. Good evening. <laughs> My name is... Uh... Matters. My name is Jason Williams. I'm a third year apprentice and a, uh, and a proud member of the UA local steam fitters. Um, I support this legislation, expanding prevailing wage to mechanical service work, open more doors for people but like me and many people uh, who made bad mistakes made in their life. And I was uh, 29, I was incarcerated for 11 years and eight months. Total sentence was 31 years. I got out in that time period. While I was incarcerated, I started a welding vocational class. Just by a blessing and unfortunate, a friend of mine, a dollar in front of mine, since I hadn't seen him in 15 years, came to visit me. His wife was a member of the local team fitter 602. I you know, told her some of the production I was having in there. She told me to do such a production, do welding when I got out with the union. So upon hearing that, I did part. To uh, acquire information to practice for the apprenticeship test. At that point, um, after practicing, I was released. 
blessed enough to find and uh, get part and take the test, which I passed. Only after that, uh, I started to work four years ago. Um, immediately, I became, and through my training and through those years, being in the apprenticeship program, it gave me times and moments as a person speaking. For instance, just last night, I went to a Billie Eilish concert with my daughter. I left when she was two weeks old. So that was a dream come true for me. The apprenticeship helped me do that. It helped me pay for those tickets, <laughs> which were astronomical price to me being in prison for 12 years. Um, through that apprenticeship program, it's very helpful. And then that time while being there, uh, I've met other men and women who have taken full advantage and um, changed their lives. And it's also help others to see their opportunities, things and other so this legislation is and expanding real world opportunities for people to earn good wages in both construction and the service I, I do the work we get paid well for it so I'm telling you my story it's this legislation and I would like for you to pass it and do whatever you can do to help thousands of people and many people like me to get the job and have second chances I appreciate your time. Thank you so much. We're going next to Jeffrey Guado. Roger Mano. Oh, oh no, I guess I'm skipping somebody. Roger Mano. Oh, okay. He doesn't add it anything. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm, I'm just here to answer any questions if anyone has any. Thank you. Support this lovely. Okay. All right. And then we'll hear from Jeffrey Guado. I thank you, Madam Chair, Vice Chair, and Committee members. Uh, Jeff Guido with the Baltimore DC Metro Building Trades Council, supporting Senate Bill 259. Service maintenance work requires the same skilled craftsmanship, uh, professionalism that is uh, used on new construction. And uh, a robust maintenance system on a building can give it decades of purposeful use. Equally important is the prevailing wages support apprenticeship. The building trade unions in partnership with our signatory contractors manage $26 million annually in apprenticeship scholarships. It's the largest post high school scholarship program in Maryland. It's earn while you learn with no student debt. Senate Bill 259 will ensure qualified, safe, highly skilled crafts professionals on public projects and protect local communities from the deterioration of local labor standards. Our members represent the safest, most highly skilled and productive construction and maintenance workforce in Maryland. Without prevailing wage laws, contractors will be further hard pressed to find qualified skilled workers to accept jobs with unfair wages and little to no benefits. Prevailing wage laws are vital in the construction and service maintenance industry. And more importantly, when these laws are protected, America's middle class is empowered. We ask the committee for a favorable vote. Thank you. Thank you. All right, we're going next to Bill George. Thank you to the chair and members of the committee. My name is Bill George. I'm with the Maryland Municipal League today here uh, supporting House Bill 259 with an amendment. Um, MML is not often involved in legislation regarding prevailing wage. As many of our members already pay workers the prevailing wage on construction projects of varying sizes, while others rarely have public works projects that exceed the $250,000 threshold. The provisions of this bill, however, would have broad applicability across municipal, municipal governments and the management of their facilities. The impact will be felt across our membership, but particularly in the smaller municipalities with limited budgets. Expanding the definition of construction to include certain mechanical services is not particularly troubling. However, the low threshold of $2,500 for their mechanical systems work is to some degree. The current prevailing wage law, as mentioned, deals primarily with large capital projects, uh, but this new lower threshold for mechanical systems uh, captures routine maintenance. We would propose an amendment that raises the threshold dollar amount for mechanical systems work to keep it more in line with those larger capital projects that can be found in the current prevailing wage law and move away from the ongoing operational projects. We're happy to work with the sponsor and members of the committee uh, on finding that exact dollar figure. With that, we support the bill uh, with this crucial amendment. Thank you. Thank you. And then finally, we have Brianna January, unfavorable makeup. Good evening, esteemed committee. Brianna January here with Maryland Association of Counties, also known as MACO, in respectful opposition to this bill. Uh, as always, you have my written testimony. 
Uh, committee, counties already have the ability to apply the prevailing wage for maintenance contracts. And as the bill sponsor himself noted, several already do. MAKO here is simply asking that counties continue to have that flexibility and not be mandated to do so, which simply may not be appropriate policy for all counties, each of which operates under different regional market and economic realities. Um, counties, as the owners and operators of public facilities, they already implement complex operational and fiscal systems to manage facility management. And these systems are all uniquely tailored to the needs of each jurisdiction and take into consideration those important regional differences, um, such as local markets and the availability of materials, costs, and businesses that shape county facility maintenance. Um, unfortunately, SB 259 does not take these differences into consideration, and the bill would undo the current uh, reasonable approach, and instead it would prescribe a uniform one-size-fits-all policy to county facility management and service work. And um, at that, it, this would be an extremely costly blanketed approach, um, capturing, for example, most school construction projects and that ongoing maintenance and a lot of other capital projects where the state partners with counties even if the state is just a minimal partner at only 25%. Um, so as Senator Hershey noted, we're talking about public buildings, which are often more complex with higher service costs. Um, and for these reasons, Committee MAKO opposes SB 259 and does urge an, an unfavorable report. All right, we have questions from Senators Reedy, Hershey, and uh, um, Feldman uh, in that order. <laughs> Okay. Uh, two, two questions. First is I look at the fiscal note and the significant local impact, which MAKO and MML both sort of address with. Bill from MML, do you, I know you guys have an amendment you want to try to address. I mean, the significant local impact, you know, to me, that's, that's, that's very telling that, you know, I know, you know, my county, I have several small towns I represent, uh, but you guys feel the amendments you have would address that or... Right. So, yeah, that's a that's a good question, Senator. And, and you know, I don't I, I don't know at the moment what what exactly that dollar amount would be that we're looking for. And that that was fiscal note writers don't know either. So they said it's possibly significant, though. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I mean, you know, um, Ms. January for, for Mako, you know, touched on, you know, the diversity of their membership. And, and we have that as well within the municipal world. Right. I'm you know, the average. Um, the average budget for um, uh, Maryland's municipality is, is just over a million dollars. Um, and so right. 2,500 may not seem like all that much when we're thinking of the Gaithersburgs and Annapolis's of the world, but when we're talking, you know, the Tawny Towns um, uh, in Carroll County, we're, you know, it's a, it's a more significant budget hit. And, and to have, you know, the $2,500 threshold for them extend over the lifetime of that contract, that's, that, that adds up quickly. So then I, just one other question, Madam Chair. I know it's been a long day, but these are important issues um, that impact a lot of things. If I could ask Mr. Guido a, a question. Sure. Um, I was listening to your testimony, and um, I, I guess when you talk about the challenge of, of people finding work and making a, 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 well, a good enough wage or a strong wage for this kind of work, my understanding and everything we're hearing on this committee as far as workforce development is that businesses are desperate for skilled labor. And that they are paying, uh, they're willing to pay. I see signs everywhere for people looking for HVAC and for other types of labor and work like that, as well as you know maybe more menial or less skilled jobs that are paying much higher than I think we ever thought maybe thought possible. So can you comment about? I mean, are you saying that there's not? I mean, are you saying there's not a competitive marketplace for labor right now? I feel like I feel like the worker is very empowered at least right now, has a lot of agency. That's true for the skilled labor. Skilled labor doesn't come cheap, and of course, cheap labor doesn't come skilled. But uh, mm -hmm. if they're having a hard time finding them, they're, they're, maybe they're not paying quite enough. I mean, we well, have. It sounds all, to me like we don't need to rate, add more prevailing wage. It just sounds like, I mean, I, I don't think the problem is that people are not. Well, I'll leave it at that. I, I think there's a there's a shortage of work right now, and I think people are the, the market is responding to that. I don't think we need to artificially wa raise wages beyond what the market will bear when the at least when there's such a robust market. If there was a glut of unemployed HVAC folks, maybe we'd have a better argument. That's just my opinion. But well, that would be a supply and demand issue, of course. When there's more demand than supply, the wages go up. When there's uh, you know less demand, then the wages go down in the non-union field. 
our wages are pretty much set through our collective bargaining agreements. Okay, Senator Hershey. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, first, Ms. Ms. January, you uh, talked about the, the impact that this would have on the, the counties um, in respect to their uh, cost, cost going up. Again, that wasn't made clear in the, in the fiscal note other than it would, would go up a lot. But we, we just heard in the, in the last bill, as a matter of fact, that prevailing wages are so much more expensive, mainly just because of the, the, the work and documentation of all of this. And, and we've heard many times before that just because you pay people more doesn't mean that they're more skilled. So don't we see in the rural, especially in rural counties that a lot of times we have local contractors that are able to come in and handle these projects, handle especially service contracts, uh, at a, a significantly lower cost than prevailing wage. And if we were able, if we ended up passing this bill, we would have to wipe out all of those contractors, find prevailing wage uh, contractors and increase costs through, throughout the counties? Yeah, absolutely, Senator. Thank you for that question. I think that that's um, an exact example of what I was getting at with the differences in regional um, in uh, the regional realities that our membership faces. We not only have uh, regional cost difference for supplies and market, but also for the actual um, employment forces that we're able to, to procure contracts with. And that is exactly why um, a one size fits all approach like this is just not appropriate for Maryland's very diverse geographical regions. I would, I would imagine that, that in, in many counties, there are many qualified contractors that could handle this type of service work without having to be prevailing wage contractors. And I think that would be a benefit for, for many of the smaller counties with limited uh, county budgets as far as operations are concerned. Yeah, I would imagine so. And I'd also note that um, one major difference between our membership and that of MML, for example, is that as counties, we are um, talking about our public school systems, right? So um, this would virtually, how the bill is currently written, it would virtually encompass all public school construction. Um, and then the maintenance, obviously, of those mechanical systems, um, where the state is at least 25% a partner, which is virtually all public schools um, currently. And so we're looking at a much larger um, breadth of impact on our end as counties versus, say, the MML folks. Thank you very much. Thank you, Madam Chair. Senator Feldman. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I'm, I'm just trying to, uh, this is also for, um, for you, Ms. January. I'm just trying to kind of figure out how to tailor this. So, um, you know, cause it's a little confusing for me because I don't know process wise how MAKO takes a position. But as I said earlier, we have testimony from the biggest counties of our state that are actually passing this very bill at the local level. So I'm having a little trouble reconciling uh, sort of how you as an organization decide you're gonna be opposed when Prince George's, Montgomery, Charles, uh, Baltimore County has testimony in the packet supporting the bill. Uh, just one second question, just so I can understand sort of partly process. The intent of this bill is this, these are dealing with state procurement, state funded projects. I, and, and, and that is kind of what we're talking about, not county projects. So just so I can kind of understand both process wise, how MAKO takes a position when the majority of the state or at the local level are doing what the bill does. And then secondly, the bill is sort of designed to deal with state procurement and state projects it has nothing to do. It's not preempting anything happening at the local level. So maybe you could just explain why I'm a little bit confused and then maybe perhaps an amendment might be in order, but I'll just put that out there, Madam Chair, for uh, Ms. January for me. Go. Sure, uh, thank you for that question, Senator. Um, as I noted in my testimony, counties do have the ability already to apply the prevailing wage for um, contracts of this nature. And um, several, as you've said, already do so. MAKO here is simply asking that we continue to have that flexibility and not be mandated to do so, which is just not appropriate for all of our members, um, which are operating under very different uh, economic realities, regional circumstances, et cetera. Um, regarding our process, we take a vote as a unified body and um, we do not parse out uh, individual county votes or anything of that nature. And so um, as a unified body for, for the greater good of all of Maryland's counties, our legislative committee, which is composed of, um, you know, 
commissioners, county executives, et cetera, um, decided that this was something that we needed to oppose. The one if I could fall, butt in the, for yeah, just, just a one, minute. Okay. okay. Yeah, just I one just quick thought. Okay, go, go ahead. ahead. Well, just what in the bill is mandating the local counties? How is this impacting the flexibility of the counties? This is state state project, state procurement. I'm sure, not, but, but the language says any project at which the state partners at at least 25%. Okay. So, so that's where that's where okay. the state I just partners. want to make sure I understood. Thank you, Madam. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Okay. okay. Thank you for that clarifying point. Senator, I want to remind everybody we have a voting session in a few minutes as soon as everybody can get here. Well, so Madam Chair, I have one one other bill. Don't forget that that last bill is one witness, so it's good. But don't forget about my last. Yeah, yeah. But. yeah. <laughs> we haven't forgotten. Okay, okay. I did, but I just want to remind people, Senator Hershey. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. You know, just to respond to. Senator uh, Vice Chair's question. The fiscal note does say local expenditures may increase significantly for ongoing maintenance of public works owned by local governments, but a reliable estimate is not feasible. So um, maybe that's that's the concern or, the, or where, where MAKO and MML came from um, if, if they're owned by the local governments and they're responsible for the maintenance of it. But I would think a, a clarifying amendment would certainly be able to help alleviate those issues. Okay. Thank you. All right. We've got one last bill to do. Senator Feldman. Yes, Madam 144, Chair. 144, and then we will. We will yes, this is going to be a very, a very short bill, Madam Chair, and, and I don't think controversial at all. Um, so several decades ago, actually starting in the 1950s there, and lasting through the 1970s, there was a drug uh, often referred to as Laetril. Um, the, the actual name is uh, I'm Amy Gadalin, but uh, it's a little complicated. Laetril, let's go with that. And was usually uh, widely used for cancer treatment. And in the 1970s, the FDA uh, concluded there was no evidence at all whatsoever to indicate uh, that the treatment was effective and interstate shipment of the drug was banned. And so not only was it not effective treating cancer, according to the FDA, but according to the NIH, there were a multitude of side effects, nausea, vomiting, headache, dizziness, liver damage, hypotension, fever, mental confusion. And on top of all that, it can cause cyanide poisoning. The American Cancer the Chemical Society calls it a potent poison. So for the reasons, uh, that, re for reasons that really remain unclear, the drug is still on our books and remains legal in Maryland to prescribe under a 1982 statute. Uh, so given all this, and not surprisingly, this drug was, has been banned in approximately 30 states, as well as by the FDA, who has the policy of uh, pursuing charges, actually, against medical professionals who prescribe this drug in any state. Um, all this bill does, Madam Chair, is it puts us in line with 30 other states and FD, uh, C, uh, FDA policy uh, by repealing the subsection of the Maryland Code that permits for, uh, for physicians to prescribe and hospitals to administer uh, this drug to treat cancer. So that's all the bill does. Um, I don't know why we didn't do this earlier, but I asked for a favorable on Senate Bill 144, Madam Chair. Thank you. And we have one witness, um, uh, Dr. Paul Solano, Maryland DC Society of Clinical Oncology. Uh, hello, thank you for allowing me to testify. Uh, my name is Paul Solano. I'm a medical oncologist, medical director of the Sandra Mar Malcolm Berman Cancer Institute at the Greater Baltimore Medical Center and president of the Maryland DC Society of Clinical Oncology. I'm here to support the, the bill SB 144 or repeal the authorization of amygdalin or laetril. Uh, uh, the senator has just uh, uh, aptly uh, listed all the reasons why this, uh, this should be repealed. And I am in complete agreement with what he had said. There, are, there, there is no clinical use in the treatment of human cancers for amygdalin or laetril. Uh, there are plenty of things to treat patients with, doesn't limit anyone from treatments and no, no society uh, of, of, of repute has, has uh, endorsed the use of laetril in any form for the treatment of human cancer. Thank you. Uh, we have... Um... D Dana Kaufman, on behalf of MedKai, signing up favorably, but with no testimony whatsoever, but it's a favorable. 
And so that ends the testimony on this bill. And colleagues, if you'll get to the committee room. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't see Senator Kramer's hand. Senator Kramer. Yeah, I've got nothing, Madam Chair. I just wanted to wrinkle the committee real fast. <laughs> oh, shucks. OK, 